And welcome to the Jordan B. Peterson community. Uh, each Saturday, we do the Jordan B. Peterson study group where you can engage in discussions about Peterson's lectures or a related topic. And the last week of every second month of this, the study group becomes a reading group instead where we discuss one of Peterson's recommended texts. So that's the case for this meeting. We'll be doing our final discussion of Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, specifically focused around the topic, how do we structure society to protect ourselves from ordinary men? And you can find all the details at jordanbpeterson.community, so instead of .com, .community. And I'm joined today by uh, Tyler as well as John. My name is Benjamin. And I guess we'll just uh, kick off. So the last two meetings we did was, yeah, on ordinary men. So the first one was kind of talking about significance of this work. So it's a work talking about how uh, Reserve Police Battalion 101 came to commit atrocities when they weren't actually racist. Um, and it goes into the events and then a summary of the factors that contributed uh, with a, a collection of the social sciences research of it over the past more than 25 years. Uh, and then our second discussion was kind of focused more on the analytical side. Uh, so what caused these people to do these things? And then this one will be, how do we protect ourselves from people like that? Um, or rather, how do we protect ourselves from these factors that contribute to committing atrocities? Uh, mm -hmm. So the, quest the questions we have uh, to explore in this session will be how to structure society, how to prevent the ramp up to a society where such discrimination is possible. How are we risking the same today? And what manifestations of ordinary men are happening today? Uh, so it'll be an open discussion. Uh, we made a switch a few weeks ago to turning this one from a summary session to one which was actually just one of our discussions. So we're going to be interacting on the fly and experimenting with ideas we haven't experimented with before. Mm -hmm. it, it's funny that we're doing this today because like, I had watched the conversation, the recent conversation between Jocko Wilnick and Jordan Peterson. And Jocko Wilnick brings up this point, like a good leader has to recognize that within his one uh, battalion or, or troop, whatever the term is, uh, there were, you have to take into account that there will probably be one like psychopath out of one out of 40 within that that group and so it's like you have to be aware of that and, and if given the chance this psychopath like all, all that's needed is letting is telling him that uh yes he, he, it's it's like all, all that's needed is giving him a field in which he his psychopathy can be made manifest and so that that's really what it is like it, very fitting with your title, like uh, how can we protect society from ordinary men and understanding that ordinary men also include the psychopaths. Like how do we protect so society from the, the, m the minority extreme that, that can overhaul society if given the chances? Send them to war. That's um, that's partly what much of um, misplaced male aggression was used in the past for, right? There's a hmm. there's like a testosterone, there's like a a broad scale testosterone lowering uh, institution, and that is the army. Right? Like, mm -hmm. it kind of like exporting, of yeah, it's like exporting all of our uh, male aggression. Yeah, right? and it's funny because like I, I read a book. Um, tribe and, and it exactly. talks a lot about like the the, the <laughs> exactly the toxic masculinity a lot of the people that like self-select for going into the army are doing it to avoid uh living with their abusive parents or whatever it is like that because that's a, a great way for them to get out of that and so just through that happenstance there there's going to be a lot of psychologically unhealthy people that are being put out on the front lines, uh, killing other people. And so, yeah, that, that's a great risk is you're exporting the, the crazies to do your mm -hmm. bidding off. So this off is, uh, mm -hmm. this is interesting because I, I, uh, 2016, I actually applied for the army, uh, the Australian army, uh, as a reserve position for the, uh, so apparently in Australia, we have, 
uh, I don't think this is uh, uh, secret knowledge or whatever. Like it's the media has publicized it a lot. So like, you know, we have terrorists operating in the outback, like doing the trading and stuff. So then like part of the army's What's responsibilities the uh, is to, uh, uh, you know, uh, so this pos particular position was to form uh, uh, relationships with the, uh, you know, the different tribes, uh, as well as anyone in the outback, and then try and get information on uh, whereabouts and then potentially engage with uh, terrorists who are doing training. <laughs> and um, But anyway, through that interview, you do like an IQ test, uh, you know, that little computer game that you play, and then... Um, that then determines what roles you're fit to then and engage in. So I was like able to engage in pretty much like 90% of them, except for like the more uh, aerospace engineering uh, stuff, like the um, the more strict engineering roles. And then, um, but they also, so you do like interviews with a whole bunch of people, um, but you also do a psychological fitness test. Um, so they actually evaluate your uh, psychological condition as part of the recruitment process. So I, maybe America doesn't have uh, that good fitting, but like at least for, uh, uh, yeah, for me, I think, all right, you do guys, you, you do that or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have something called right. the ASVAB, which is essentially the, the IQ uh, yep. general knowledge test. Um, so do they do the, uh, the psychological the evaluation? evaluation? Yep. Right. Yeah, you got to pass yeah that and a uh, health examination so yeah, yeah that was that one of the why. more popular ways for a lot of people to dodge the draft back in the vietnam war era was to uh, fake some kind of psychosis people would sit in their own shit filled pants for a few days and then show up for the evaluation <laughs> wild <laughs> taking a bath for weeks and just covered in their own feces and but Interesting. Some to do. yeah it was, it was quite effective yeah some of them got passed through anyways though yeah there are a lot of these stories that came out after the war but <laughs> war, yeah. is, war is hell man war is hell and people will shit on themselves to get out of it yeah i think uh. rand uh and most libertarians are against the draft right like they kind of view it as uh as slavery yeah, well, yeah, it would have it's, to it's break almost, the volunteerism rule. So yeah. Yeah. it's almost certainly the whim of a few minor players at the top, right? It's, it's it's rarely the collective will of the entire people enraged against another nation that sends them off to war. It, it, it's like Alexander wanting to conquer the world, or uh, some uh, Chinese uh, emperor wanting to further his dynasty or some blood gang leader wanting to expand his territory it's it's, it's people people who die always die for the people at the top right yeah well there is a big difference between the um the draft and then just normal recruitment because normal recruitment still fulfills voluntary action whereas yeah, yeah. The, that's um, self-selection self-selection yeah. is beautiful that's what you want that's exactly yeah. what you want no. You want you want this so the, the way I conceive the best so to to segue into our actual discussion about how we can help well maybe not I guess we're already started on it but to segue into to new forms let's say that help us prevent ordinary men from getting into this position you, you and to speak in general terms you need a period in time in which the individual grows up and finds out something about themselves about who they are. And traditionally, this is, I think, that the elementary and primary and secondary education time span is, is what we've set that time aside for, right? And then you're supposed to have, find a role in civilization that allows you to be useful, right? Um, we know that it's the case that if male aggression isn't used in a role, it tends to pretty awful things. Right. So, <clears throat> so we we need we need something that is effectively uh, letting people find out who they are. I, I don't know if that's happening right now. Hmm. It's more it's more along the lines that 
it see what it seems like is that people are molding children into little forms that they want, but yeah. they're choosing forms that no child can fit into or should should not fit into. So this is uh, actually before we went live, we were talking about Alf's Void's uh, coverage of Peterson's Scandinavian uh, interview. Um, and there's a clip actually in this where uh, the female politician is then saying, look, I believe I should be able to, you know, if I raise my child in an environment that supports leadership, then I think my child would be better suited for these roles um, or as a nurse, but I should try and raise them in a way of to as if they would be able to fulfill a position of power. And anyone I think who's tried to raise children, like there's a great book called The Real Purpose of Parenting that I read many years ago. And so I was like, holy shit, if, if every parent read this book, the world would be a lot better place. So the book kind of goes and like, well, you know, in the, the yeah, well, yeah, because it's common as a parent to then want to, you know, you see the potential of your child and you want to blossom that potential, but you can't force, like you can't kick them down that road. Uh, that can cause rebellion or just isolation and different emotional issues. Uh, you actually need to like kind of find out who they are as an individual person and then kind of guide their facilitation to grow themselves into that area. It's kind of like, um, I guess, trying to nurturing a plant or, you know, converting a plant into an animal, right? Like a plant, you control its growth. Uh, uh, Kind of thing like in the bonsai tree whereas an animal you actually have to work with it to try and manifest it into a a uh, a good good outcome respecting its person and uh so peterson ended up returning back uh uh and i think alf's void missed the point of this so peterson ended up reporting uh retaliating back and then said that's exactly what someone who only sees the value in social constructionism sees uh uh, and not the biological side because, you know, every child or every individual has their own stuff. Like, it doesn't matter if you're going to raise, like, someone who wants to be an artist uh, as they're going to be a CEO of a company. Um, it's completely different uh, goals that this individual has, and you could actually constrain them. Like, say, trying to raise someone who wants to be a nurse as an engineer won't... Uh, you know, it will probably just make them unhappy. You need to find out what this individual wants. And I, I was having this conversation recently with other people where so it's like, how do we actually solve this? And it seems like, because for instance, language acquisition, uh, there's like a certain age, it seems zero to three, in which case, if you're exposed to as many languages as possible, your ability to acquire languages later in life is way improved. So then, uh, or it's like for music, uh, music is another thing like this. Early childhood exposure to music will then improve your ability to express yourself through music. But I wonder if that only applies to the people it applies, because it could be generalized out to the general population, where it could only be, that only applies to people which already have an aptitude to that. Because for me, I had exposure to languages, but it never took. Um, well, I had exposure to so many things that it never took. It probably has an effect, some maybe some measurable effect, right? But what amount yeah. of that effect, we're unsure. Someone who's susceptible or uh, has a predilection towards music would certainly demonstrate more of an effect from the same stimulus, right? Right. So if you, you play one Mozart song, and if you have a, a keen ear for music, your parents are mu musicians, or you're exposed during the womb and all of that, right? Then hearing that one song at just the right time can spark a lifelong interest in classical music, right? We have plenty of yeah. anecdotal evidence, biographical data, people experience things like that. I've experienced things like that. Like those we'll seed moments. That's similar to like the, the instances of like learning a language at that certain age period. Is it like that's that's a point in time in, in which you can learn music as in kind of the same way that you would be learning a language. I don't know. It might be, it might be. Yeah. So a Ian different... Gilchrist's uh, mm -hmm. suggestion is that the right hemispherical language is musical to some degree then in that it's initial prototypical phase or, or was some element of music. Right. So it, 
I, I, I like that idea. And I mean, I've always got a song playing in my head, so it. I, it it, I'm not. I'm not sure about it. I, I think it is effective. Uh, the the a effective. So like of emotional. Uh, because for instance, when we dream, I never have music ever in my dreams. Uh, and I think so. I think maybe the right hemisphere is more the performing arts. And the things that trap me about certain songs where I get them repeated in my head, which happens, it used to happen a lot when you're a teenager because songs are more novel then. And then as you grow older, things become less novel. But every now and then a song, like actually only a few days ago, actually I found a song that I, I spent maybe an hour crying to. <laughs> and uh, the, no. uh, yeah, <laughs> I cry to everything. Like I'm one of those anime girls in the TV shows where it's like, ah. <laughs> Yeah, but an hour, like an hour, that's a long time, man. That's a serious, yeah. like, that's a deep uh, yeah. connection there. Well, it's the same thing with that uh, movie, uh, Grave of the uh, Dragon, no, Fireflies. Fireflies, Grave yeah. Of the Fireflies. So I watched that after I watched um, oh, yeah, you did uh, like A Pace in the Corner of the Universe, and then I followed up with The Grave of the Fireflies, and then I was just like, holy crap. And I it's like, because when we initially watched that movie, I watched it with my partner, uh, we we didn't get that much out of it, but then it was only through the introspective questions of it afterwards we actually got like some very heavy hitting things from it, and um, and that was quite intense. But so my point about at least the music is, uh, so for instance, uh, the songs that really affected me back in the day were okay. Maybe there was a random trance song, but it was mostly like the emo screamo uh genre of music which these days doesn't even exist which i think is to a lot of the things we have seen with issues of teenagers now they don't have any music to cater towards their emotional angst they just have music to uh cater towards the uh the the sexual urges <laughs> and that urges to fit in rather than urges uh you know music communicating their angst but like there's another guy on youtube called oliver something or other um, and he puts like mud on his face to like become like this, uh, it's really, really weird stuff. Like his, it's kind of like possession in an art form and, uh, like this doesn't have music, but like things like that, like Poppy, for instance, I really like her stuff. So I think it's more like, uh, there'll be a certain theme in a song that then captures us, captures us, or maybe like, cause to some extent people talk about Bach a lot or like you know these great classical things and to some extent that music paints a landscape like post rock is one of my favorite uh, favorite genres because it paints like this emotional landscape or the scene that you can then follow along to and feel but then i wonder about that like i don't think it's the right hemisphere is only or you know is predominated by this music fear because otherwise i'm completely musically uh inept like i have no ability to to you know, embrace that as much as I try. Like I can perceive it and kind of get along, but my ability to distinguish instruments is really poor, my uh, my understanding. But it's just like every now and then something communicates to me, but I think it's more through the artistic nature, like the performing arts like this. Uh, something that I previously pushed underground, like this, the idea of catharsis was then expressed through performing arts or through music or some type of artwork. Uh, so then it was a loud expression and then that then tinted the uh, right hemisphere to then gain expression over my brain compared to the tyrannical left hemisphere. That was uh, uh, quite a long uh Yeah, I mean, all that made perfect sense in terms of me being a, a slightly left brain dominant thinker. That, that all yeah. makes perfect sense. Yeah. I, I think one very important thing we would need to consider in, in creating a, or, or at least conceptualizing the creating of a uh, well-suited society that doesn't fall prey victim, fall victim to the instances of ordinary men uh, is taking into account the problem of uh, nihilism and suicide in, in modern Western societies, which is quite on the uh, rise specifically mm -hmm. in the in the US for uh, especially the what gen z uh or or igen uh, it, it's yeah it's 
for there's a lot of young young people that are uh, falling victim to that, which is surprising because it, like you would imagine in the more poverty stricken uh, areas of the world that the people that are living in the worst environments would be the ones that were that would be most likely to commit suicide. But that it, it's hardly the case, really. It, it's more so the, the people that are in uh, these more wealthy societies. And, and like, I think yeah. it, it's similar to the case, like people like Robin Williams committing suicide. It's like once you get to the top and realize that it, it's not what you were looking for, that that can just be uh, soul crushing. I think. Yeah. Williams uh, Williams is um uh, not necessarily an example of that though because he was suffering from Lewy body dementia. Mm. Uh, oh, okay. Just, just to point that out. Yeah, he he ended his life probably intentionally so that he wouldn't avoid or to, to avoid a, a long suffer a long drawn out suffering. Um, oh, okay. The ending of his life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that well, came I know, up after like, the fact. the The initial uh, the initial thought was that he was just unhappy or depressed. But after the autopsy and all that information came out, mm-hmm. it's most likely explanation. Gotcha. Okay. Well, well, I, I know for certain at least Leo Tolstoy in his autobiography, uh, he that that was at least his position that like after being extremely wealthy and uh, in a high like well educated elite. Uh, it, there was. Well, we mentioned yeah. Paris syndrome before, right? We were talking about that. This oh is yeah, similar, yeah, like similar the thing. Asians that go to Paris to see how wonderful it is, and then after they've done so, they uh, just like fall into not uh, it, it, fall into despair because of it. Yeah. Like th- that was their peak. Yep. It's uh, there's something there's something that um, expectation is like. It's like the production of a vacuum state somewhere in the mind, right? And it's waiting for some buildup to fill it, right? And it, and if and if the buildup that fills it doesn't like it's designed to fill it doesn't quite fill it, you get the sense of dissatisfaction, right? Of letdown. Uh, I, th- I think if the if that vacuum state is too large, right, the the dopaminergic and or serotonergic collapse that occurs when that when that build up, like when that charge up of expectation fails, like, it's just too much, right? It's like a little, it's mm. like an instant depression. It's like it kind of. Sorry, going. I had a I had a, a realization of this a long time ago. Uh, when I was still young and had dreams of glory, let's say, right? When I when I see when I sat down and I seriously considered that maybe, maybe you will have nothing to do with history. Maybe you'll just be another Joe Schmo that fades into the pages that were never written down, right? And all you did was have a couple of kids and get married and live your life right and i and I, I sat down and i seriously considered that after having lived much of my life being pushed through a kind of orgiastic frenzy in the schooling system where people are all like oh yeah get as much knowledge as you can and and you're going to grow up and you're the next generation you're going to change the world and so it kind of implants this expectation in you right so when i sat down and i considered this like it it really was a kind of collapse of expectation it, you know it's like a total collapse so that uh, thing where you say this you can do whatever that's uh something that's more unique to american culture than british or american. australian yeah. culture yeah because mm-hmm. our one is just like the exception is this idea that you might actually change the world <laughs> and uh but i think it's interesting that the parallel was drawn uh done with uh the paris syndrome because and what you just said that was fitting. And it made me think of uh, maybe this is one of the reasons for like high divorce rates in the West could be due a Paris syndrome of marriage. Like it's a very common idea that, you know, our marriage is going to be our be all end all. Uh, and this partner is going to meet our every need. Uh, and that seems to be like Paris syndrome, where it's just like we actually be married for a few years 
and it's just like, huh, uh, right. boy, this it doesn't really live up to my expectations. And then people like divorce rather than figuring it out. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's just like, no, well, that's I the think... time when you're now going to negotiate. You're like, figure yeah, out what you actually want. Like, that's when you finally test it. Yeah, so it's a combination of things. Like, see, marriage used to be the instantiation of like the cultural implication of how important it was. So the legal necessity of it was quite strict, right? And divorce wasn't easy. Now it's very easy. So the the barrier for divorce is lowered, and at the same time, the social structures that have kept it, it glued together have diminished. And also at the same time, there's this third other angle that's like friction, which where the social structures outside of it are built to almost specifically to tear families apart, right? So working long hours and uh, having uh, cost of living require two people working out of the home, and all sorts of crazy stuff that shreds the fabric of it. So the, the necessary stress level and the threshold for which you get to where divorce is an easy option is just, just so easy to meet now, right? It's too easy. Yeah. So let's, uh, for the suicide topic, I, I think that's really valuable to touch into uh, because one of the other things is South Korea, I think, has the largest per capita rate of suicide, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, and I, then I think the next is Japan, and I think probably the yeah, next would be... Yeah, if it's not them, the it's probably Japan. Yeah. And then, because um, there was Utah like... Utah is probably up there somewhere I think, too. Yeah, I think Japan is like double USA and then South Korea is double Japan. So it's like, I think out of uh, per... that I think it's out of per 10,000, 30 in South Korea kill themselves. In Japan, I think it's like 15. And out of the West, then it's just like five or so. Um, so it's still these like small... Uh, things, but I just wanted to before we delve into that because I think that is relevant and worth exploring is the one about the psychopaths in a group. So I think this is interesting because with military uh, psychopaths, male psychopaths would gravitate towards that uh, because you know it's an expression of the things that male psychopaths are interested in, which is physical domination over other people. Um, whereas oh, yeah, females, I knew a few growing up this explicitly stated that they were going into the army because they wanted to shoot people. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, but I also wonder about this because, okay, say it's one out of 40 due to self-selection that are psychopaths in the military. Well, what, th so this is, th th one in 40 is way higher than the normal 1% of the population for a sociopath. Or for a double, psychopath, yeah. right? So it's way higher. So self-selection causes a high gravity of psychopaths in groups that psychopaths would be, be gravi uh, gravitate towards. So let's flip this around and think, what about the female psychopath who is concerned about uh, controlling others rather than dominating others? And I wonder how many uh, people in government or human resources or other things that set policies are then exerting female psychopathy. Um, I don't, is it going to I be don't know if it's, 40? I don't think it's necessarily controlling others. That's the, the toxic femininity. It might be similar to, uh, I guess, conforming or, or being accepted by others. That is the, uh, the one well, talking. I think what this, so I wouldn't say, uh, like, because, for instance, toxic masculinity in, is part of, like, every male in the same way, like, toxic mm -hmm. femininity is part of every female, whereas the, psych yeah, like, yeah. the psychopath spectrum is just, like, we're talking about Philip Bernardo and his wife, right? Like, Philip mm -hmm. Bernardo is a sexist, and his wife actually gives his sister up to Bernardo to, while they both rape and torture the sister to be killed. And it's just like this, or you like you read about like hitchhikers getting kidnapped and things, and they'll be locked in a dungeon while the wife gets off on this idea of being able to control the husband to also, you know, or kind of like being like a side helm. And I think like you see this mm -hmm. where like serial killers, uh, you know, once they go to jail, they have all of these mm -hmm. women wanting to have sex and marriage offers. Mm -hmm. I, like, I guess it's kind of the uh, Beauty and the Beast or uh, what the Fifty Shades of Grey. 
uh, conception, the ideal story there. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, so you, I mean, that's part of it. Yeah. yeah, so Jung Jung thought that or, or recognized or did a lot of work alongside the idea that uh, part of the ways that women break is on the masculine inner side, the animus, right? And then when that breaks, when or when they become possessed by it, when they become possessed by the animus, they become highly aggressive and assertive and attempt to control. So mm-hmm. there there is something to that element of it, and I would say it's it is highly likely that the bureaucratic machine that exists to assert control over social institutions is an excellent place for th- that tendency to, to gravitate. Mm. Mm. Thinking about an instance sense. of what I just proposed, the uh, one of the founding stories of Gamergate uh, is in relation to a female what's by all measures seems to be a female psychopath. Uh, so this was someone who consistently cheated and lied to her boyfriend while she slept with every single man in power to then get favors in the favor bank to then manipulate her uh, position in the industry to hire and hire abilities. Uh, so women have this interesting thing where they can exploit uh, men's desire for sex to then gain power and favors from men as well as to blackmail them, which is you get a man to have an affair, you have so much fucking leverage over that guy now. And, you know, he pretty much becomes your servant um, because of what he now has to protect. So I think it's like, so it's interesting because she didn't really go into policy, but she kind of went into journalism, I guess, instead. Um, And journalism maybe is a good form because the whole journalistic industry is female aggression, feminine aggression, which is gossip, character assassination, and rumor. Um, Whereas the male... uh, You mean what it's become or what it should be? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 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 definitely not what it, uh, well, you think of what journalism was 50 years ago and it certainly wasn't what it is today. It actually resembled research <laughs> and, uh, really, you know, interesting, uh, well, I, I don't know. I think that journalism is still going on today. It's just washed out by the vast sea of shit. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole yeah. lot of really good journalism. Really good journalism. It just doesn't see the light of day in the main streams of thought. No. That's what this whole intellectual dark or uh, 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 the IDW is about, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think uh, a core problem with journalism is it's incentivized via ad revenue. And so like, I, I don't know, it was just something I, I noticed ju- just today. That there was, like, a recent hit piece against uh, PewDiePie that I saw on my uh, Google feed. And I just clicked it anyway just to see what it was, even though I already knew about the hit piece and had seen it from PewDiePie eh, and, and, like, knew what it was about. And I still clicked on it. And it's and so they still got, like, that ad viewing from me. Yeah, you gave them, like, a fraction of a penny, man. Uh huh, and it's because they're talking about PewDiePie and doing it in a in a controversial way. That's how they get like clicks and anything like that, and that's what they're they're going to be manufacturing controversy so as to uh, protect their bottom line, really. Yep. So you have this giant beast called the consumer market, and that giant beast has plumage. And that plumage is called the marketing department, right? And the plumage department seeks to show off the wares of the consumer market to the world, right? And as long as you have anybody in the world willing to buy things, right? That there's never going to be an end to this because they're just going to keep sucking the money dry, right? Like, the the plumage will extend further and further and further. You know, they're in the 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 gas pumps here in America now. Do you have those yet in Australia? Oh what? yeah, they're yeah. like showing ads, yeah. advertisements, and videos at the uh, gas pump. 
uh, I don't think I've actually seen them here. Maybe I saw them once in Asia, but I haven't seen them in Australia. Maybe we do, but it, if there is, uh, it would be quite bizarre, I guess. Yeah, we're, we're getting there, man. It's, it's, it's. The, we don't uh, have uh, advertising on. Uh, on some tr in Perth, there's advertising on trains, but I think it's more like government advertising. Mm. Uh, in Sydney and uh, in Sydney, there's no advertising inside the trains or inside the buses, but oh. there is advertising on the outside of buses. Yeah, we sell like every square space we can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In uh, in right. Asia, there's actually advertising. Uh, like in Kuala Lumpur, they have advertising inside the trains. They have these little videos that play. Um, all right. So to, to bring it back to our conversation, I, I do think that this is relevant because I think it has an effect, this rampant consumerism and the overall impression that most people have that culture and society is really focused around the buying and selling of mostly useless items, right? It's, it contributes to... Uh, it contrib contributes to a social situation where people are dissatisfied with life. And, and that's why we're seeing all the culture wars occurring right now and the pressure welling up from the Peterson side of things, questioning you know, why such a progressive mindset and to the directions it's going. But I, I think that that is, that is a serious pressure, right? It's a serious social pressure is the satisfaction of life. And satisfaction in life is certainly not to be gained in consumer markets, it seems. Yeah, it, it seems to be more like people get their meaning from furthering, let's say, group causes for one. Or, or it, it, even just like acting politically is another way of like people gaining meaning. And, and I think that kind of leads with it. So it's like the desire to make things better. So hope is a, a motivating drive be behind a lot of people. And, and that, I, I think it is, what? it's just most of the time people don't know how exactly to do that. And so when they actually attempt to do it, to do it they might in fact actually be making things quite a bit worse. Well, I think it's, uh, I think the, there's a high abstraction of that, which is significant. So significance, you can either make things uh, good or you can make things bad, but you're just wanting to have this, like, you know, like that mm -hmm. could be the dr drive for views, right? Like the how many views or followers I have is like a measurement of significance or how much impact I have on my coworkers, that's a measurement of significance. Or whether or not I hold a gun to somebody's head while they plead for their life, that's a measure of significance, okay. uh, which is what the serial killers or school shooters generally do. Like, mm -hmm. like and... Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Medico, he does these good analysis of uh, shooters, uh, uh, you know, serial killers who have snapped. Um, and generally, uh, from what I can gather from his thing, which is that uh, these are people who haven't found a way to express significance through any other means. So, and Tony Robbins actually talks about this as well. He was the first one who actually un uh, uh, found the concept of uh, holding a gun in someone's head as significance. Uh, he was the first person who told me, uh, you know, through his material, uh, told me that. And then, um, so it's more like, because I think this tie into suicide uh, and to tie it in with that the psychopathy thing is this, uh, like there's an interesting book called Suicide, a study, a sociological study, and it evaluates like, depending on your religion depends on how, whether or not you commit suicide, which is really interesting. Um, so different religions have different rates of suicide. And you would think that while well, all these people are part of the same culture, but it's that they have different belief systems to then cope with the afflictions that affect, uh, affect them. So they find ways to transform our moments of inaction. So there's like, the, and there's different categories of suicide. So uh, the most, one of the most common ones is escaping pain. Uh, and then the other one is a predetermined, premeditated act. So that would be euthanasia. Um, so the escaping 
uh, or maybe that one's also serial killing, but the escaping pain one is the people who step in front of trains. So it could be they're having overwhelming emotional pain that doesn't have an expression um, and they need to neutralize it. Um, so they do, you know, they jump off bridges or they walk in front of trains. So they do things that um, immediately bring a seat, like a stoppage to that pain. But you also think of this as, well, what is the cause of this pain? And the cause of the pain is an, an inability to rectify the situation that causes the pain. And I think that why we also see um, high rates of this in develop. Well, OK, well, one is developed society abstracts meaning away from our jobs. So that can help us become depressed and feel as if we're less significant. It just leads to this social condition, which we then now become predisposed to pain or, or existential pain. Um, because if you're too busy trying to get food, because otherwise you will starve, that's enough significance that you don't have to worry about your existential significance, right? And it's interesting as well, like so many people who are in sex dungeons, um, they don't kill themselves. Uh, and I think it's because the real world afflictions to them are so severe, that's the cause of meaning, right? Like they just want to like, you know, either spite the, the 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 oppressor or you know they just have things that are worth focusing on um to try and get them through and i think that's maybe the religious aspect which is different religions than say uh you know like god is uh like the form of confession or prayer like god is this thing that listens to allow like this catharsis where you can express uh this pain that you feel um but yeah, so I think. Well, well there's also yeah. the fact that m most religions have kind of a social taboo against suicide. So it, it's like it, it could be the case that there are those that would commit suicide, but uh, from the social pressure are not given that option, kind of. Yeah, this is highly likely in the Catholic Church, for instance. Right. Yeah, I, I unfortunately I didn't uh, finish the book. I only got like a third of it through, and then I uh, I got too many messages from people, and they were like, uh, "Is everything okay?" Because <laughs> my Amazon <laughs> activity was public then, <laughs> and I was like, like no, I just find it interesting." <laughs> and uh, but I think um, yeah, like this, especially like in relate. I actually published this Medium article. Uh, last night uh, saying uh, he is cruel, she is weak, about how if a man breaks uh, in a moment, then his perception is, or the perception is that he is cruel. So when he's been pushed to the limit and then something snaps, then the perception is that he is cruel and irresponsible. Um, whereas if a woman snaps uh, and then becomes cruel, then that's excused because she's weak, uh, vulnerable and justified. Uh, so then it's just like if a man expresses weakness, uh, it's viewed more as irresponsibility rather than vulnerability. Um, so then if a so for instance, like this is a thing which is like the responsibilities that a man has to take on with a female request for more power, but yet for some, you know, with the men, male rights activists, it's kind of like females are wanting power, but then delegating the responsibility of the shortcomings to the state uh, or, you know, to the masculine enforcer uh, rather than themselves. And it's like this extra responsibility. And then when a male eventually snaps, then it's like, um, uh, you know, well, he's just being cruel. He's being toxic masculinity, whereas it's rather than, you know, this was a moment of weakness or a moment of vulnerability that we need to address in the first place. Like, um, so I think in part of this, like, like, you know, people can go to the army or go to psychopathic environments because it adds meaning and it allows expression. It allows, mm -hmm. like, it allows a form of catharsis. And I, I'm watching a series of, it's really interesting from animes, like the animes catered towards women are fascinating. I just finished watching a TV series, which was another thing which I, uh, <laughs> it was a four high school girls or whatever, and they go to a trip in Antarctica. 
And in this TV series, they get presented with a social problem. And they, and these are common problems that I guess many high school girls or, you know, any high school that goes through. And I'm, is someone eating chips? Who's this punk? <laughs> it's Judd. Judd the punk. <laughs> I didn't know that could pick it up. I was like messing with a piece of paper, like three feet away from it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So then, um, so in this, they present like some, you know, social issue, and then the Japanese girls and the thing they articulate the issue incredibly well in a way that would be beneficial to the audience who is going through this issue. And then for the highest, like for the on the masculine side, we then get things like Dragon Ball Z or Neon Genesis Evangelion, or um, there's a guy called Ape Trap Visuals on YouTube, and it's just like these are horrifically violent animes. And then I, I look at these and I'm like, well, that's interesting uh, because uh, the, uh, so like Japan, they, you know, they have this violent history, not themselves, well, not necessarily themselves, but just of what has happened with the world wars and then the Hiroshima bombs, like horrific things happen on their home country that could not be ignored. And now they've gone into this hyper-capitalistic, hyper-competitive market. And then it's just like, it's interesting because where's the masculine aggression gone? Because now aggression is then in company versus company. But then in the same way that like the West is obsessed with incest porn because of the high rate of divor divor yeah, divorce rates, uh, you know, it's like an expression of something that has been repressed. Um, then it seems like Japan is going to these hyper violent animes, perhaps, um, as a way of expressing this uh, this mask, like this physical aggression, or giving voice to it in this, uh, you know, this performing arts uh, catharsis technique. At least that's my. Uh, yeah, the 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 art scene should tell you a great deal about a culture and and what's broiling up. From underneath, and so should, yeah. I mean, that should be a general, well understood principle. Or it's a good, there, there was actually there's a beautiful treatment of that in a, a Star Wars book. In fact, the the continuation of the Star Wars series, Grand Admiral Thrawn would bring, uh, he would he would study the art of an alien to learn its tactical weaknesses in battle. Right? Mm. There's a great deal of. Uh, insight to be gained emotional weaknesses let's say right mm -hmm. okay so let's try sorry john so just just to mm -hmm. uh tie this in then it's uh because i think this expression thing so like you know that's allowed the violent animes have allowed and as well like the content like the the themes that they evaluate like neon genesis is like this really interesting existential crisis in like the world of the abstract um or as well like the other animes that i've looked at too which are more like cross-gender applicable and things like that like there's a lot of addressing of these uh certain issues that are faced whereas in the west uh like sports has become feminized in schools uh, wrestling is no longer an option or th like say in Australian schools uh, AFL is largely Australian football league is largely banned from schools and then there's a uh, touch foot touch rugby uh, which is uh, the common thing so things that don't really prevent that much aggression because of again it, there's good reasons for that which is a risk of uh, lawsuits or whatever that could happen from someone injuring themselves but then there's also like the unfortunate aspect of that, which is like, you know, as a young boy, then you have so much like bent up energy and you need to find ways of actually uh, finding ways to exploit or, or sorry, uh, deplete that energy through some type of expression. Um, and, you know, anyone who's tried to go like 40 days without ejaculation uh, would know this uh, energy kind of thing. Like uh, it's it's quite uh, interesting. <laughs> like, like the movie, I think, was quite accurate uh, with the type of energy uh, involved there. Because, uh, but 
uh, but yeah, so I think like through sports, what, like what um, movie was that? Forty Days, Forty Nights. Oh, um, didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, so it's a guy who has to go forty days, forty nights without uh, ejaculating. Um, and I, I think on week two, like he gets a little bliss thing, like after a few days and it's like, hell yeah. But then towards the end, like, he's just looking at an electrical socket <laughs> like, like he... <laughs> and, uh, but for, um, I, there is a way. Yeah. Okay. But that's a digression and it's not really an important digression. Anyway, the point I want to get to is like through, um, I say running for myself like when i run then it actually allows an expression of this built up physical state um, of aggression now that aggression can be utilized and that high testosterone that high adrenaline and that high cortisol now gets uh converted into endorphins and dopamine and serotonin that actually uh uh you know yeah, convert aggression into this feeling of oneness um, and painkillers as well, which are the endorphins. And to some extent, that's also what like good sex is meant to do as well. Uh, through sex, it's a physical exertion with bonding afterwards. So you also get oxytocin. Um, and that's, you know, that's a good thing to build up that bent up, uh, you know, to convert an aggression into a... Uh, uh, you know, a more peaceful bonding or like a, a you know, a oneness type feeling. Um, whereas, so I think it's also like the lack of sport and like you see sport is vitally important to like the development of boys, like wrestling or anything that allows them to gain control of that physical aggression. But then as adults, um, you really have to just find your own type of, you know, be a gym membership or running or, you know, a sports team. Like if you don't have those, like, then it's very. Yeah, like, I think that's one sad element of growing up. In fact, in our modern culture, is that there's such a well-coordinated system of sports for children. But once you get to be an adult, it's like it, if you, you don't find a uh, extremely uh, keen hobby group, you just don't continue any of that stuff, and you end up watching it on TV or the internet or something. It's it's a. Yeah. Yeah, it's a sad, it's a sad replacement too, because the, I mean, the exercise alone is physiologically, it's just very good for you, right? It's yeah. not, not, not just these creative energies that have to find expression, but. I mean, it, yeah. Well, it's good that you said creative energy. So there's like this aggressive energy that needs to be converted. And then there's also this creative energy. So like I was talking with a comedian recently. And he was, uh, you know, about how I ha keep having all these ideas, but then I don't act on them. And then that makes me even more anxious. And he kind of like, yeah, like comedy for a lot of people is this tool of like he said, well, for creative people, they get this creative energy and they need to relinquish it. Otherwise, they go mad. Like, oh, sorry, not relinquish, but express it. Um, because once they've expressed it, then it kind of uh, dies well, down and they feel good again. Yeah. So, so men. Men in particular, and I'll stick with men because I'm a man, and that's the best. And you know, you know. Med, yeah. Um, you know, we speaking from a, from a naive sort of biological perspective, our, our greatest, most intense desire uh, upon becoming a man through the, the puberty process is to impress and win a woman. Right, that's the sensation of it. Right, like we have this desire to do something that impresses a female which then achieves a coupling of some kind with them right uh and and so the energy involved in and what it is you do to impress them varies based on your personality traits and capabilities and whatever social cultural environment you have to be in right it may be something as simple as passing a note across class that makes her giggle or winning the science fair at school or uh, something as crazy as uh, what Edward Leedskalman did in South Florida and building Coral Castle over a period of 40 years. Right? Like there's, there's this or jumping off the, uh, the roof into a pool. Sure. Yeah. Like there's a huge variety of, of, uh, of ecstatic 
creative expression. And this is why Jung associated the libido with the creative energies and with the productive capacity and this psychic energy, right? That that's that is the way that we perceive it now. If you is, this is what's so fascinating with the um, the control of sexual reproduction in the religions, right? Especially in Christianity, let's say the and the the language, in fact, bears it out. Uh, the individuals who suppress their sexual urges uh, and devote themselves to religious pursuits or to devotion to the church of some kind. What, what they're doing is they're replacing that creative search for desire of coupling with a mate. Uh, and instead of a desire of coupling with a the mate, their desire is to please God or please the church or uh, the, uh, the language used in the New Testament is that the, the church is the bridegroom of Christ, right? And this, this language represents the, the type of perspective that many people have. And so the same is true, and, and I think in a number of other cases in our modern era, but what seems to be taking place is that this very base source, this incredibly primal, deep drive of uh, this re this almost bottomless resource of energy. I mean, how many orgasms do, we, ha, do, like, do you ever get tired of orgasms, right? You, just, you can't get tired of orgasms. <laughs> it's, it's bottomless. So that like, there's this fundamental bottomless well perspective that we have that that we can just keep driving towards constantly with creative energy to achieve right it's a huge part of it that's it's a huge part of ordinary men being an ordinary man and so you have to have an avenue to to be fruitful to be productive and if it's not in the seeking of a mate it has to be in the self-expression of creative energies no here's here's what's really fascinating about this if you're an artist you can think of this as like the left hemisphere trying to impress the right hemisphere right so in like it's almost like constructing something reducing the possibilities of chaos into the order of some unique exhibit for the sole express purpose of eliciting uh, an emotional a pleasing emotional response from your own right hemisphere so you're like you're like yeah. trying to woo you're trying to woo you're, you're you're going through a courtship ritual with yourself so this is interesting because when i was uh evaluating uh you know my uh i guess impulses towards orgasm or be it porn or sex or whatever it is one of the things I found that made me susceptible, besides you know the how duration it was before my last orgasm uh, ejaculation, then the the one was when I feel like I accomplished something. That's when I really had a desire for sex, or a desire for ejaculation. What um, about frustration? I think this is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, well, that's the other thing. When I felt like I had been beaten and lost. Mm -hmm. um so like that was the other thing so it was like when i've accomplished something then it's like sex is the reward whereas if i feel like i've be been beaten then it's just like well sex is this comfort uh instead um yeah. that, that that's very common i think no and and it makes uh, total sense i mean it's like like i was describing the uh, expectation vacuum before right like it has to get filled somehow Otherwise, you yeah. collapse. Yeah. So for this uh, thing, then Napoleon Hill, he also talks about in Think and Grow Rich that one of the uh, I think it was thirteen traits. Uh, I can't remember how many it was, but one of the most essential ones was sex transmutation, which was that he found that the you know five thousand most successful people all transmuted their sexual energy into their uh, their pursuit of work um right and that's not to say they didn't have sex but it's just that you know rather than sex being the uh the desire instead the desire was uh work instead yeah well i think i think the the history of western civilization is essentially the gradual replacement of men thinking about sex every seven seconds to men thinking about sex every 14 seconds, right? And we squeezed another seven seconds. I, I'm making a joke, right? But it's that's not true. 
I think that was making the rounds as a myth a few years ago. Something men think about sex every seven seconds. But the the idea is that we've replaced the creative energies. Like so, a normal prehistoric man would have thought about copulating maybe fifteen times during the day. Let's say as he's swinging about the trees or however prehistoric man got around, right? Uh, but as we've developed more and more things to replace our attention and time and energy with, you either convert the, the neocortical habitual structures to take advantage of that same energy that was driving those thoughts before, or they're in conflict, right? So how is it that you like redirect that energy towards something else? Well, I, in the case of people who do it for things like God or the church, I'm really not sure. Uh, I, I've struggled trying to see that perspective, but in terms of trying to impress a female, that seems to be the perspective that um, that most people, that the route that most, the, str the strategy that most people adopt is, is the, the sense that you are trying to impress a female and that all of your energies are headed towards that direction. And it's not just necessarily impress a female, but but or the the broader uh, maybe more um, important concept of developing a family, right? A strong pair bonding, which then produces children. So that that goal, that mindset, uh, is a strong attractor that then allows the hemispheric energies to kind of work their way mm -hmm. towards it. Well, I, I guess there's also then the like seeking of approval from peers, like e e in like male dominated yeah. areas where well, that's, there would that's still a be that, that system, drive. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the climbing up the hierarchy. That's uh, how you find confidence. out what kind of woman you get to win with your actions, right? That's mm -hmm. essentially so how I, it winds up being. Chapter 11, it is of Thinking Growing Rich, the mystery of sex transmutation. Let us read this beginning bit. The meaning of the word transmute is, in simple language, the changing or transferring of one element or form of energy into another. The emotion of sex brings into being a state of mind. Because of ignorance on the subject, this state of mind is generally associated with the physical and because of improper influences to which most people have been subjected. In acquiring knowledge of sex, things essentially uh, physical have highly biased the mind. The emotion of sex has back of it the possibility of three constructive potentialities. They are the perpetuation of mankind, the maintenance of health as therapeutic agency, it has no equal, and transformation of mediocrity into genius through transmutation. Uh, so it's kind of like this uh, last part here, I guess, which is that bit. And I think, John, bloody hell, man. Oh, sorry, I thought I was... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the uh, the yeah. So it's quite interesting. So I think this perpetuation of mankind is one that, like, say Gandhi, uh, he was he didn't really like sex that much. Um, he viewed it as only a, and, and I think that's quite common in a lot of arranged marriage situations. They view sex as merely the perpetuate like a thing for reproduction rather than anything else. Um, whereas women really view it as this one. I found the maintenance of health. Um, and I think mm, a lot of men month, just feel it as this one. It's definitely number one. <laughs> so if, if you're not on, if they're not on a, a pill, uh, once a month, it is definitely number one. <laughs> There's it's, it's remarkably, uh, well timed. Yeah. So I don't yeah, understand so the, whole the third goes one. Into it. It's the, the transmutation of mediocrity into genius. Not well, sure you see this. So that's what kind of essentially what uh, what NoFap is about. trying to do. Uh, so NoFap is all about uh, that one. So it's kind of like okay, instead of like you have that energy and it needs an expression, and you can cheat it by just masturbating, right? Or you can use this energy to go for a run, right? Like this energy is a propulsion. It's like a rocket. So you can either, you know, extinguish the rocket through masturbation or you can use that energy to actually bring yourself to something you want to do. That's um, dopamine. Yeah. Uh, and then it's also interesting, right? Because, you know, as I say, like the way that I view sex is 
or the times when I desire it is um, apart from, you know, from attraction, then it is uh, when I feel like I've achieved something or when I feel I need to be comforted. So the achievement one, I think, is also what three is about, which is uh, no fab tries and manifest it. So instead of masturbating, you go out and you actually build a life circumstances where you can manifest the reward of sex. Um, so you actually want to, you know, utilize this rocket ship uh, or this rocket to direct your life into ways where the result is actually in congruence with biology and nature. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that uh, one concept of comforting yourself, this is a key notion I think we need to discuss perhaps is there are two types of feedbacks. You have positive and negative feedback loops. And so in, inside the brain, this propulsion mechanism that drives you towards some goal is met with whatever you want to think of as the, the withholding mechanism that tells you to stay away from whatever direction you're headed, right? And so you can think of these as positive and negative feedback loops. And we think of them sometimes as high level heuristics, like little phrases that we repeat to ourselves, right? We'll say something like, uh, you know, I'm angry, so I'm going to count to 10 before I act. And if I do that, the anger will subside, right? Right. So uh, this is an interesting bit. So this is the last few chapters of, sorry, the last few paragraphs of that chapter. Man's greatest motivating force is his desire to please woman. The hunter who excelled during his prehistoric days before the dawn of civilization did so because of his desire to appear great in the eyes of woman. Man's nature has not changed in this respect. The hunter of today brings home no skins of wild animals, but he indicates his desire for her favor by supplying fine clothes, motor cars, and wealth. Man has the same desire to please woman that he had before the dawn of civilization. The only thing that has changed is his method of pleasing. Men who accumulate large fortunes and attain to great heights of power and fame do so mainly to satisfy the desire to please women. Take women out of their lives and great wealth would be useless to most men. It is this inherent desire of man to please woman which gives woman the power to make or break man. The woman who understands man's nature and tactfully caters to it need have no fear of competition from other women. Men may be giants with indomitable willpower when dealing with other men, but they are easily managed by the women of their choice. Most men will not admit that they are easily influenced by the women they prefer because it is the nature of the male to want to be recognized as the stronger of the species. Moreover, the intelligent woman recognizes this manly trait and very wisely makes no issue of it. Some men know that they are being influenced by the woman of their choice, their wives, sweethearts, mothers, or sisters but they tactfully refrain from rebelling against the influence because they are intelligent enough to know that no man is happy or complete without the modifying influence of the right woman. The man who does not recognize this important truth deprives himself of the power which has done more to help men achieve success than all other forces combined. Yeah, so they clearly they agree with what I was saying before. <laughs> that's, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's really interesting because the, um, it, you know, it's touched on a lot of things we've discovered ourselves over the course of the uh, study group, I guess. Um, and, yeah, it's, I think, yeah, it, it is, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's really Revealed interesting. I always keep coming back to this again book. And again. Yeah. Like this book is just so great. It's just surprising, like how how many times it continues to give. And it's like, oh shit, I forgot all about this. I need to go back and study this. Like, yeah. So, yeah. But uh, all right. Okay. So I was bringing up the uh, the notion of positive and uh, negative feedback loops uh, because it's on the one hand you need a type of comforting mechanism, right? Um. And on the other hand, you need a type of stick or carrot that motivates, right? And it's the presence or lack of these things that allows for the creation of the environment where the 
uh, reserve battalion 101 type stuff can take place right when you don't have necessary protocols in place or heuristics at the individual level that are strong enough to, as a negative feedback loop or positive feedback loop to get the action in the right place that it needs to be right morally mm -hmm. so yeah there, that's the like twofold double-edged sort of institutions where in the instances where a single individual is incapable of controlling themselves, such as like if they're addicted to uh, drugs or alcohol or something like that, that's where an institution is necessary so that they can uh, refer, like put themselves into an environment where uh, they are like forced to actually do the things that they know is best for them. Or you can get the instances like in ordinary men or just different battalions out there where, uh, one what or, or the like social pressures of the group are what is like reinforcing the worst out of everyone uh so, or like gangs different things like that where you have to go through a certain process to be invited into the game and gang and then you're seeking out further uh, encouragement from the people in that gang. And so doing further and further crimes within it. Yeah. Well, that, that's mm -hmm. another avenue for creative expression or energetic expression, right? Is is the, the seeking of the in-group preference of some kind, which is probably tied in with the seeking of a mate eventually. Or, or naturally, let's say, as one would hope to either derive riches uh, or uh, a direct connection with a mate in the process of joining in with the group. Yeah. So what's strange about ordinary men is they never once talked about this, uh, this sexual transmutation or any of this, the sexual gender side of it. It was purely other reasons that were talked about. And I wonder whether or not they looked into it and they found that not to be the case or whether they just didn't look into that. Because there was a story in there where one of the majors or commanders or generals um, continuously brought his wife to the grounds uh, of the killing to show off to his wife. Uh, and I'm not sure whether or not they actually said whether the wife was disgusted or whether the wife was endeared by it. Um, but it was all, they did talk about how a lot of the propaganda that was that the German men should breed as many German children as they can, um, to win through, uh, that avenue. Um, but yeah, there wasn't really that much discussion of any sexual, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, tensions, um, that much. Uh, in that book, so I guess for our analysis, there would be speculation, but um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not so sure that every man is as uh, driven by sexual desire as much as, say, maybe women are or, or tend to be. Uh, there's Oh, because I don't know, men are more expendable and tend to. Uh, well, it it really does depend <laughs> on how long they've it's been since oh, no. they've ejaculated. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it depends. Like that's certainly true if they're masturbating, right? But if they're not masturbating, <laughs> then uh, then they're a completely different creature. <laughs> no, I, I was just meaning like the people that put all of their energy into their career and they're like not driven as much. It's not like they're expending all of this energy just so that they can get a mate from doing this. It's like actually the drive to, uh, I, I guess, be the hero. That is a, a lot of what's also driving them. Well, I wonder to the point where it's that. not even, uh -huh. go ahead. Because, like to have that amount of focus, you either be masturbating or you need to have a supportive wife. 
um, because if you don't have a supportive wife that can tend to your needs, then that becomes a bigger problem that affects your career. So you either need to then be masturbating or you need a supportive wife. And then it's just like, well, if you eliminate masturbating, then you do need some support network to do that action. Um, otherwise, you have, uh, well, I guess, oh, yeah, okay, there's the Buddhist and the religious thing of, okay, just wait until we have wet dreams. Um, however, uh, or there's yeah. prostitutes or things like that. Yeah. But I think um, the wet dream one with the advent of instant high definition porn uh, is a, the incentive structures away from that are very high. Like you need one hell of a discipline to be able to go that route instead of the masturbation route. It's like, you know, it's kind of like a God like discipline, <laughs> um, I guess. Um, but yeah, the, cause that's the thing. Like, I think the top tier people there, at least in Napoleon Hill, they don't take into account. I think like they're viewing it as, you know, masturbation doesn't allow you to use that energy instead of kind of like that energy is defining your attention. Um, because then it's just like, oh, you know, I'm getting distracted now. I just need to beat one off. And like, that's a large part of, um, it's not no fap. It's like uh, another a few communities on Reddit. They like as like pre masturbation, and it's like you're stressed out, and then post masturbation, it's like this bliss of peace, <laughs> kind of thing. And it's just like, well, that's um, you know, that's kind of just showing that you're being ruled by your need to masturbate. And in the same way, like a cigarette smoker is ruled by, you know, like that's the exact same way a cigarette smoker feels about the cigarettes. Um, yeah. Hmm. I, so are we saying that the route of prevention for ordinary men becoming animals is chronic masturbation? No. I, I did, did, well, I think chronic masturbation then leads to... Uh, emasculation. Yeah, emasculation. Yeah. I, I, I'm just not seeing really the, the correlations or causations within any of this. It feels very much like <laughs> Freudian interpretation, like everything is tied back to the no, sex no. behind the scenes. Well, we, we, we do know that um, we, well, we do know that neurotransmitters are responsible for all your brain activity. We do know that masturbation uses a heavy, heavy dose of, or sex in general, right? Uses a heavy dose of that of a specific type of neurotransmitter. So it's um, all of the anecdotal uh, evidence of people who say that um, stopping masturbation and or uh, exhibiting discipline over that aspect of their lives produces some kind of euphoric feeling or and gives, gives them more energy or something like that. All of that makes sense from that perspective, from a neurophysiological perspective. So it's not necessarily a, a Freudian uh, analysis, but... Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I can understand kind of like it's a part of your brain that was always uh, like focused on that. And then to be free of that would definitely, yeah, help out, uh, which kind of like after, after you fast for a while from eating, uh, you kind of lose having the hunger pangs uh, to the point where like you, you don't have to eat three times a day anymore. You can just eat like once or twice oh, and it doesn't matter as much, but it takes a little bit, but it does happen. Well, the point here is it's like a compounded interest benefit, right? Which is that, okay, there's the compounded result of masturbation is there's a lot of energy that was then devoted to the seizure of the desire to masturbate versus the seizure of the desire to build up a situation around you where that urge to ejaculate is now rewarded by an actual woman. Um, so, you know, you go down one path of doing that and it leads to, you know, a few years later, it's a very different result than the one of trying to build up a situation where it's actually rewarded by, you know, what that urge meant, which was a woman um, or sex. Or, and, and you think of this as well biologically, right, which is, um, you know, that urge is an urge for sex. And if you play your cards right, then you've now built up 
a environment of reward that is now conducive of family. Um, so it's like a way of, you know, an appropriate biological and societal reward, which is you work hard, you do well, it is valued by the community, you get a, you know, a woman and you get children. Uh, whereas if you were to just say, oh, I don't need to address this, you know, or instead of dealing with this compulsion that is incredibly strong, I'm just going to neutralize it through masturbation, then, um, you know, like, it's very easy. Like, like, I'm sure everybody at some point in their lives has been in these, like, binges where they're depressed and they just eat junk food, they watch YouTube, and they watch porn, and they masturbate, and that's their life for, like, three days, <laughs> right? And it's just, like, 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 whereas you can't imagine that same situation applying where it was a woman involved, right? Because if it was a woman involved, then either, like, you must have somehow earned that woman to get that reciprocation, in which case you actually have to work to continue earning that woman. Uh, otherwise, that woman will leave. Um, so, like, you can't manifest that same, like, extremes on both uh, pathways. Do you see what I mean? Like, it, like, because the ideal, right, is like the Hugh Hefner type thing where you've played your cards so damn right that, you know, you get a, a <laughs> you get a orgies with uh, beautiful women. But then again, well, uh, the <laughs> ideal of, of a certain type of man is that I, I don't think that's. Yeah. 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 That's a, a good point. There, right. There seems to be some yeah. kind of spectrum where uh, between monogamy and polygamy of some kind. Right. There there's. There's an innate desire of one, you know, one partner up through to infinity for some. <laughs> I've yeah. Enough time. So. I also wonder about that because, like, it seems different religions cater towards those different desires, um, and different cultures over time have catered towards those different ends of the spectrum. But like, even in uh, the Islamic religion, you're only meant to take on another wife when you have the ability to do so. You are not meant to take on another wife if it will bring uh, the inability to support your existing wives. Um, so you have to play that balance appropriately. Now, that's not to say they, you know, they actually practice that, but that's the guiding principle there. And it's also like in Christianity, at least, um, I, I think through the Old Testament, there was the notion of like, if your brother dies, then you inherit his wife to prevent her from experiencing poverty. Uh, I wasn't really, or if you were, um, uh, your wife was infertile, then you could take on a bride. But that wasn't really a double marriage situation. Uh, Islam was kind of the only one that I was actually suggesting double marriage when Christianity it was more like protection of your brother's wife as well as use of mm -hmm. surrogates. I think yeah. that's more, I mean, it, it is in the Old Testament. I don't know if it was ever really practiced within Christianity, but it, and yeah. it might have still been done. I don't know. It feels more of a, a Judaic uh, tradition that it is sometimes still carried on, but not as much it that I know of. Mormons as Christians. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. true. But I, I don't know. I, I thought the polygamy in... Uh, uh, Mormonism wasn't necessarily related to that uh, Judaic tradition, but uh, of course, I, I guess I wouldn't really, really know. Uh, yeah, it was, it well, was, uh, it was directly tied scripturally to uh, to David and his wives, actually. Okay, David and his wives. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. still like really am intrigued by the Judaic Christian tradition though uh, of that because it's it's kind of like a cultural safety net for uh, a, a man to know that in the instance that he dies that his family will be taken care of because it's a, because he tr as long as he tr trusts his brother that is uh, to be uh, stable enough to take care of that it I don't know, is this uh yeah cultural safety net for dangerous activities or or protecting the 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 land things like that yeah well he just needs to trust his brother more than he trusts the alternative 
right? Like, because that's the thing. It's just like, okay, let's say the brother isn't better than him or his brother is still pretty shit. Right? Like, is that shitness still better than her being on her own with possible children? In, in yeah, the, yeah, no, in, the, in the time frame we're discussing, absolutely. Yeah, in, in the in historic uh, old, old uh, Levant, <laughs> yeah, you're not, you know, your prospects are not great. And if you happen right. to marry into a family that's sufficiently uh, uh, blessed to uh, to be able to have brothers with also, you know, the, the ability to take you on that, like, yeah, that, that's, no. you don't pass it up. Yeah, it was it was right. polygamy is a great way to expand a population uh, and to expand it according to, say, the, uh, the the successful of the group. Right. If you are also including the notion of something like has to have the resources to uh, support them. Yeah. Yeah. Or even uh, through the way that war plays out often, which is the conquering, uh, the victors uh, breed with the uh, the now exchanged wives of those who perished. Um, so it's like an injection of the strength into the new population to come. Um, and the values, which is what Genghis Khan did. Um, but then again, you just... <laughs> Like they didn't provide any support for these women who are now bearing children. <laughs> so yeah, I'm uh, not sure he's a great uh, example. Well, didn't Genghis Khan kind of like bring forward a new uh, just society like structure? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Like bring well, that's it also the truth. If yeah. you brought about an empire, then there's peace within the empire. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, by conquering to that extent, you've obliterated your enemies. So the pe the wives and the new children aren't going to uh, have the threat of war uh, over them. And as well, the empire is incentivized to protect their empire. They do not mm -hmm. want to let their empire die. So. Yeah. When lions, uh, the male lions come in, take over a pride bill, kill the, the children of the females. And then the the female lions will become aroused by that. It's such a weird like moral <laughs> system within the animal community there. Well, yeah. it makes sense. It makes sense. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, humans did it. Like Genghis Khan is doing that. Like that's, I guess, lion ethics uh, enacted by humans, which is one of the mm -hmm. interesting things about humans, our ability to take different ethical systems from different animal species and apply them like we, you know our hand as well like our hands stimulate like uh organ you know limbs of so many animals like we can use it as a beak we can use it as a uh, tail we can use it as whatever we pretty much want we can use it as a mouth in communication so uh all right uh let's let's uh, so how do we and... stop ordinary men from becoming brutal yeah. savages so, okay, so we've got this sex thing, uh, and I'm not really sure how we can tie this in because the book didn't give us any hits on how to tie that in at all. Um, but I think, okay, maybe, so one of the questions we had was, uh, let's walk through the question. So we've got how to structure society, how to prevent the ramp up to a society where such discrimination is possible. How are we risking the same today and what manifestations of ordinary men are happening today? So, okay, so I think, so the history of ordinary men was there was a series of societal expectations and norms, which was, you know, Jews are against our culture. They are enemy. They are other. They are a tribe that is separate from our tribe. And Peterson talked about this actually in the Scandinavian interview where he said any time morality becomes tribal, it results in bloodshed. And that mm -hmm. makes sense because what a tri a separate tribe is, is an independent unit that is against your interests that you cannot uh, particularly trade with or to some extent you have to be careful in your trading uh with mm -hmm. well, because that, yeah. th that's the thing with uh, jonathan heights work it is morality is entirely predicated upon the in-group status so if you if there is an in-group and then there's an out group and, and especially in the cases where you're the 
the in-group is entirely predicated upon the out-group as being the enemy. It's uh, what he calls common enemy identity politics. Then there is no reason to treat the enemy uh, as being worthy of moral uh, compassion. Or, or it, there's like no moral rights that get um, extended outwards to them. And so that, yeah. that's the thing. It, 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 in what? creating a society, there would need to be uh, a, a, it would have to not be predicated upon common enemy identity politics at all. So yeah. like no enemy to Do you remember the definition of morality society? that I was playing around with before, John? Mm, no, I, I'm only thinking of your definition of borders or, or what you were talking about with immigration. I'm not sure if that's what you're no, no, that, that I, morality okay. is uh, that which creates a stronger, more cohesive bond in any energetic system is good, and that which destroys it or makes it weaker is bad. Mm -hmm. right, that, mm. That's right in line with Height's analysis there, that the, moral, the, the morality of any given system is based on the in group mm -hmm. and out of group. Problem. Yeah, well, that, that's the strange thing, it, or I don't know if it's strange, it, but the <laughs> double-edged sword of morality is you can have a intensely binding principle of the Jews are bad. And that can be the foundational principle to harbor a, a, a morality upon. Um, but what's so interesting yeah. about at least that application was that was a societal image when the individuals didn't actually need to hold that image. Um, so it's more like, out of the context of the society which we play a part, society believes this, even though we as individuals do not. But we are obligated mm -hmm. to we are obligated to society rather than obligated mm -hmm. to our own autonomy. Yeah, um, that's I, I think one of the scary bits. Yeah, I think tying it back to a conversation we had a while back, it, it, it's like it became an implicit uh, axiom within their culture that Jews were non-human, and so their actions against them weren't as bad as if they were to commit it against like fellow Germans or uh, other Aryans, anything like that. It, it, no. It's, yeah, there was, it was less of a moral consideration in what they were doing and more of just, uh, I guess, just a depravity of their own, like spending all day killing. Well, it's also, it wasn't, I guess, yeah, like, mm -hmm. It wasn't, their disgust over themselves wasn't necessarily empathy for the Jews. It was just kind of like shock at their own capacity for evil. Well, it was also, it was more empathy towards their collective, like their group, their tribe, right? Like the idea that, uh, you know, I don't want to burden my co-workers by not performing my obligation to shoot Jews. Because then that spreads the obligation to my mm -hmm. uh, co-workers mm -hmm. more, right? So then yeah. it's just like where we don't particularly like, even mm -hmm. agree with this. Like we don't hold the collective's morality. However, we have the value that the collective is more important. Yeah, it's and, a shit job, and I don't want to force my teammates to have to go through it. So I'll do my part. Yeah. So it's interesting because, like, there's so much packed into that, right? Because at one extent, it's like, because they don't even individually believe the Jews are working against them. Like, the Jews are actually individually, they see the value of the Jewish. The, they have workers that are Jewish. They have friends that are Jewish. And yet they still participate in what they believe is the collective good. And this is something that scares me about the United Nations. It scares me about collective thinking. Like whenever it is deployed, it's just like people hurt individuals for the collective good. And then they speak on behalf of the collective and they censor individuals on behalf of this collective good. They don't let individuals sort out interpersonal problems themselves. Instead, the collective must sort out the interpersonal problems. Like the United Nations believing that they are the reason for the, the social strides that have happened over the years rather than just capitalistic innovation or just individual innovation uh, that is the benefit. It's the same thing that Pearson talks about with like the feminists where it's just like 
It was the role of the feminists that liberated women and not the role of the innovation of, of birth control pills and sanitary pads and plumbing that were the things that actually liberated uh, thing. And that like ties into like this moral theory that I have, which is the economics come first and then morality comes second, which I guess kind of ties into what's, you know, ties into what you've said, Tyler, where it's morality is what strengthens social cohesion uh, uh, against things that threaten social cohesion. Because for the economics, like, it just makes sense, which is you can't have something that is moral that causes the society to die. You can only have something that is moral that is finally now possible. And to tie this in, I guess, to an earlier point uh, that you just brought up, John, which is the um, the outgroup thing where you, you're, you're through negligence, you're no longer willing to help a group. Um, so like, say for instance, when I became vegan, I stopped donating to Amnesty. Uh, and, you know, trying to exit Amnesty is a very hard thing to do. They call you up and endlessly to try and find out why and you go through like an interview process to actually stop your donations. And I said really? to the guy, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I said to the guy and I'm like, uh, you know, since becoming vegan, I don't really want to donate funds to people who are hurting more animals than I am saving people. And, um, and there was like, huh, that's actually an interesting point. Um, so like, th so that's one of the things, which is, it's just like, you know, to now it's just like, I don't, you know, I focus like I'm less more of a vegan advocate, but at least that was the reasoning. But you see this like collective tribal thing with the feminists versus the MRAs. Oh, sorry, not specifically the MRAs because they're kind of more fighting on both sides. Whereas like the, sorry, the feminists versus the um, the men going their own way crowd. Mm -hmm. So both kind of the view incels. the others. Yeah, so both view each other as direct enemies. Whereas the, the MRA is kind of like the middle group, which is just like, hey, please don't forget uh, there's a middle ground here. <laughs> so, yeah. But then like, but both tribes, like both sides, like the men going their own way, they can't see any benefit of feminists or feminism. And then the, uh, the feminists can't see any benefit of men's rights activists, activism. Like they just, the ideologues who can't see past their, their ideological uh, framework. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, something I've been thinking about lately uh, is that ideological framework is what is kind of, well, I, I guess we t talked about it a bit in regards to axioms. Like in order for me to cooperate with you, we have to have a basic set of shared axioms and a basic kind of shared worldview in regards to each other. Otherwise, um, like if, if you have a different worldview than I do, and so my actions are going to be uh, like this con or I don't know, your actions, I can't predict your actions and you can't predict mine. There's going to be that drive for me coercing you into adopting my worldview. That's evangelism, essentially. Uh, and, and you can see that with, like, this is, like, my big uh, re recent fear regarding the uh, grievance studies things and, like, the loss of peer review, uh, tr trust in peer review status, because, because people are using different sh worldviews, there are is the like requirement to focus entirely on the facts that further that worldview that is being outputted into media or just being exported out as journalism and news so that that uh, primary worldview can be furthered. And, and like, I understand the purpose behind it because like, if we all have a shared worldview, then we can all cooperate with each other. The thing is, like, I, I don't think the worldview of um, whoever's in power is automatically in the wrong because there's always going to have to be somebody in power. And so it's very much tied to enemy politics where uh, 
it, it like requires an enemy to continue forward and there's always going to be that enemy so yeah it, there is a need for inter worldview communication between uh, people of different worldviews that isn't occurring at all or isn't yeah it everyone's all talking within their own communities and nobody's talking between communities really or very few people are at least i know of a few that are like hi <laughs> no go ahead uh, i was just gonna get uh feedback from tata because yeah i think well this again is what peterson tried right that's why he wrote 12 rules of life which i think is you know the his effort to find out what is the most limited ethos to mm -hmm. uh, sorry most limited telos to then allow the greatest ethos without leading to the issues that cause the world wars um but as mm -hmm. well through even a way that's like it's not like because that's the thing which is the united nations thinks that what they're doing is is what is leading to why we don't have world wars right now and it's just like it's just because the united nations yeah. isn't going at all into peterson's 12 rules of life it all it does is just talk about this uh this control that all the governments must you know abide to from this collective interest of these elites and it's just like it's just so weird to think that it's just like the benefits is this, this top-down enforcement of everything rather than this bottom-up thing that stems from individuals. Mm -hmm. It is funny, like I had mentioned in the chat earlier today, how in creating a new society or just in, in the creations of societies, I, I, I think there needs to be the distinction between positive ethics, which is like what you should be doing kind of like the 12 rules for life, like how to, what actions should I be partaking in? And then there's the negative ethics, which is like, okay, don't be doing this. Like you, you have free reign to do anything you want, just as long as you don't do these specific things. And like, you can't necessarily have a world, uh, you can't have a philosophy of action predicated only upon like, don't do these specific things because there's an infinite amount of things that don't, fall into the taboos uh, that still is, has no like guiding principle for where you're at, what you are supposed to be doing. And, but I, I still think like the role of government is kind of to enforce those negative ethics so that like everybody um, that's within the society doesn't have to worry about those uh, taboos being broken. I'm not using taboos correctly, but th those uh, bad, uh, th those crimes to be broken. And it's like, as long as nobody's breaking the law here, I can trust you enough to not like break into my house all the time, different things like that. But yeah, you, you, there still needs that, that positive ethos to uh, for uh, for people to actually be able to act, which I think is more along less like I don't want the government telling me what I should be doing, but I, yeah, I but I'm perfectly fine. You're a damn uh -huh. libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm very much my my parents' children child. Yeah. yeah, I don't want the government telling me what I should be doing, but I'm perfectly fine with them telling me like what I can't be doing and like enforcing well, okay. that as well. Because yeah, mm -hmm. but, the, but and, and so what? Is, I, but, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is the problem, which is I think that sentiment is common through most people, but the yeah. trick here is to say I don't want the government telling other people as well what they shouldn't be doing right, where it still facilitates trade. Because the difference between a left, like a liberal, uh, well, mm -hmm. a modern day liberal, is that they say, government should stay out of my life, but it needs to stay in the life of all those who I disagree with. Um, yeah. Which is the difference. 
Well, that's the thing. Like, I'm perfectly fine with the government telling me not to steal. It, it like, that's what I was, I, I think the negative ethics are something that are much longer lasting, that, like, mm, they're not going through certain changes as often. And so, like, there, there's very few negative ethics that need to be reinforced, like, don't steal, don't rape, don't murder, um, like, like half the Ten Commandments. Like, yeah. they're, they're still very much but, well, uh, here today. <laughs> Well, here's the mm. problem, which is like, say, don't steal, then that triggers people's empathy because then it's just like, well, like, say, the orphan who steals the loaf of bread, should they have their hand chopped off or should they um, not? So, like, in Brazil, they just chop off their hands. Like, it's insane. Or they shoot, like, their hands off. It's just like, you go to Live Leak and it's just so crazy. But then it's just like, well, I guess, you know, the they can't depend on the police to do the enforcement. And I think as well, like, the like so they've established specifically it is never okay to steal even if you're hungry. You should try and work instead because otherwise mm -hmm. you're such a detriment to the social environment. And whereas mm -hmm. immediately what, you know, bleeding hearts would think is, oh, what about the hungry orphan? Like Aladdin, right? Why does an Aladdin... Uh, work uh, kind of thing and you know it's like the same thing when you like I think it depends on your empathy when you see a homeless person to what extent do you give them money or what extent do you say get a fucking job right like you know those two uh, extremes of you know interpretation are really there because the uh, context surrounding that circumstance is then projected through our intuitions so, for instance, the uh, bleeding heart would then project misfortune onto the person who steals, whereas the person who uh, says get a job projects the intuition of irresponsibility onto that person. So I think what any negative framework needs to have the context surrounding the enforcement of that to say, like, like, well, it's mm -hmm. the same thing when you print off, like, a list of demands for your children. Most yeah. people, even in human resources with adults, they do this. They're like, do this, do this, don't do this, blah, blah, blah. And they never say why. And yet one of the things that was really effective with the parenting that I've done is that for every single damn rule, we explain what's the benefits of this and what's the repercussion, like, what's the this, uh, consequence, like, the negative consequences of this rule. Right. So like, you know, so that way they know why this rule is important. Um, mm -hmm. So you have the order, which is the first thing. So until they have the intellectual capacity of understanding the why, they follow the order. That's important. Respect for authority. Right. But then as they bring their ability to be dissenters, they can challenge that why. In a few cases, the children brought up like valid points where it'll be like, well, I don't want to shower as soon as I get back from school because I kind of just want to relax or focus on my homework. So then we change like the rule uh, to incorporate that feedback to be less tyrannical and more applicable. Um, whereas, so I think like the law kind of needs to go, th well, one is also no one actually knows the damn law. We only know it when we actually violate the damn thing. And second is uh, we don't actually know what we've done wrong. It has to go to a trial. And then in which case, a very smart judge then weighs up everything and makes an intelligent verdict. And so it's like, like the law is uh, this really funny, amorphous, changing uh, abstraction that most people are not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this brings in like part of my more idealist notions for society that will become necessary is a further drive towards localism rather than the expansion of large cities because in order to avoid the free rider problem of like this homeless person might just be somebody that's lazy or a con man that's uh uh work that is feeding off of people's sense of empathy or it might be they're straight out of luck and they actually need a helping handout. For somebody that is unfamiliar with that person, like just interacting with them on their drive to work or something like that in a city of, I don't know, like uh, a million or something like that, then 
that the person that is interacting with that homeless person has no idea which of those the situation actually is. Whereas in a much, much smaller community, that person will have been around for a while and has been interacting with the same types of people uh, at the same for much longer period of time. And so there is a, 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 a wider context of understanding like who that person is and what their in social environment is around them. And so mm-hmm. there's that greater capacity to actually deal with the situation in the proper way it should be dealt with. Like, because there's a greater deal of information for knowing how to operate. There, there is an issue with this because in large part, that's like the United States. Like it's a series of states with their own cultures and their own values and their own legal systems. But what we see in the United States, like if you have one local community that treats an individual this way and they feel spited that, you know, they're not getting the treatment they want, they can always leave. And you see mm-hmm. this with the amount of homeless people that move across the country to San Francisco or Portland um, to make their big. And it's kind of like you think about this as well with spoiled children. Right? Oh, I don't want you parents. You you make me need to be responsible. Like pretty much most Dr. Phil episodes when they're treating children. And then like the kids are just like, I want different parents. And it's just like, 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 you know, it's kind of like the adult who failed, like, you know, for the, for the person who failed to become a responsible individual adult, like, then they're just stuck in this thing of society needs to be responsible for me. And in which case, they're just going to continuously move to a society which has a bleeding heart that doesn't want to take responsibility. Well, not really, sorry, to take uh, responsibility in their own cause of the inability for this individual to progress into responsibility. Now, maybe that's like, because that's really seems to be one of the major failures of bleeding hearts, which is a, a complete unwillingness to assist an individual to become responsible, that everything is society's responsibility rather than the individual's responsibility. And it's just like, it's so weird because originally, yes, that was the case, right? Like in the slavery of, you know, that took place in America, like, well, the individual doesn't have that much agency to be responsible for their own lives if their agency is constrained by the slave contract. But then it's just like, you move away from that. You're like, you want to grant as much individual responsibility as possible. And then for like, say the autistic or other people who they're handicapped, who can't uh, themselves maintain, then direct the bleeding hearts to those causes. Um, like it's kind of, but we can then think into this in terms of what well, this is also seen by the breakdown of marriage between the male and the female, which is the bleeding hearts have gone their way. And then the, uh, the paternal have gone their other way. And, you know, that's like you just have these maternal states like like San Francisco uh, where all the homeless people go because they get they don't have to accept the, the painful medicine they need to take there. They can just continue their bad habits, whereas mm-hmm. then the other people go the other way and then they don't rectify, uh, reconcile uh, other issues like say people who can't afford health care or through their inability to like say an autistic person or a disabled person like these are people who need free health care because they have the inability to earn it themselves mm-hmm. and it's just like that is an issue of compassion yeah but also those people still need meaning within their lives and a lot of people gain meaning from having some sort of job and so there needs to be like if there's in there's places where there is some sort of job that uh, not a heavily autistic person can actually uh, be able to do then definitely and, and 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 that's usually like from their social community setting something up for that or or I guess there's probably like uh, uh, social workers that also help with things like that yeah well it's it's interesting because one of uh, uh, you know, a friend of mine was recently in this musical program, so it was trying to get music, bring about the ability for autistic people to socialize and express themselves through music. Uh, and, you know, I went to this concert and it was really interesting. And the biggest takeaway I got from this was a 
you know, something that is highly offensive, yet it is still accurate, which is the notion of, like, the slogan for the event should have been stunted but capable. Because something like that really brings about compassion to the disagreeable uh, or compassion to the conscientious, like the masculine archetype, because then it says, like, you know, despite mm -hmm. the, the retardations that, you know, this population faces, they're still capable if given the chance. Mm -hmm. And that capability isn't naught. Like, that's what the Spartans, or like, is a negative, which is what the Spartans did with their children. You know, you now mm -hmm. have a negative impact on society because of your retardation, we will kill you. And, you know, we do this commonly with serial killers across the world, we kill them. Uh, whereas through these days, because innovation has made the world so damn hospitable, then there isn't really a negative, or the negative, like, the possibility for these people to express themselves in ways that, you know, like artistic things, it's just like, I don't particularly understand it, but I know that it's important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're able to actually express themselves with a little bit of facilitation. And you see this as well, like in just social communities, like more agreeable people are going to be more shy. So you have to actually elicit their thoughts. You have to show some compassion to get the meaning or the value from this person, to get the capability expressed. Um, so it's just like, you know, these are benefits and it's just like, that's a hugely offensive statement apparently, which is stunted yet capable, except it's such a badge of honor to wear. Like it's, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. it's like they, nature has exerted a much stronger limitation upon their capabilities than either you or I. And so whenever we see something as one of them doing something that is, uh, I don't know, it, it, uh, incredible or, or something that we ourselves can't even do. Like, I, I can't play the piano or play the flute or anything like that. I, I, that it, it's more, more incredible. Like, there's the movie based on the uh, autobiography, uh, My Left Foot, about that, a man that is like a, what, not quadriplegic, but can only, like, move one of his feet. And then he drew pictures and, like, he crawled around using only his foot dragging himself up and down the stairs. And, and that, that was his life. And he became a, like, famous artist drawing things with just his foot. And it's a really incredible story to, to see how people that have been given these much, like... To, to be able to see the human spirit uh, overcome the the limitations put onto them it is it's just incredible. It's something that I don't know we, we humans love to see. It's yeah. It's, uh, but yeah, it's one the of mascot other, for uh -huh. it's what. Sorry, key, sorry, that sounded yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's it, it's like it, it's it's the kind of like the mascot for our, our human ideals, like what we hear what we uh not deify but <laughs> what we see as heroes are those types of people i think yeah especially from uh, the objectivist perspective like that's the whole story of fountain i'm uh, sorry of fountainhead uh which is that people are brought to tears through the expression of like the man the temple to man uh, I think it was the temple that they built, which was like a testament to man's spirit, which is everything you outline. And like, just like I think it's also then that's the expression of excellence. Um, and excellence is one of those other things that brings me to tears uh, when I cry like an anime girl. Like BTS, like my God, like you wouldn't <laughs> think a grown man would cry at BTS kind of thing. But it's just like, I just watched the like video clips and the dance routines and like, you know, just like, it's just excellence in every way. Like say the song DNA or like fake love kind of thing. It's just like, man, it's like, it's kind of like in the nineties, right? When we had like boy bands in the West, like that just forked off to Asia. And they just refined and refined and refined and refined and improved and improved. And it's just like, you get that. And it's just like, like, it's just outstanding. Like the amounts of like, yeah, it's just like everything you kind of talked about where it's just, you know, it just, 
it's just so weird like things like that bringing me to tears or like even mm -hmm. with like a great movie like you know when i see that and then it's like it's actually it's not like the movie itself that brings me to tears but it's just like just how damn well they did it like mm -hmm. you know just like you know just things about it and it's just you know and but that's like not something to say like you know only the non-handicapped are able to achieve this like you know you see people who achieve great things through handicaps and it's just like you have the exact same feeling of it so mm -hmm. you know we're all handicapped <laughs> so in, in comparison to others is it's easy to find handicaps yeah yeah and, and what happens i think usually is just that the comparison is between you and the general society that's been built. No. Yeah. Do, do you find it easy to go about the world or not? What's frightening or, or I don't know, I, I guess more upsetting for me is to see how in the more Western societies than even like the U S or Canada is the, uh, extensive use of, um, ab abortions for the mentally handicapped uh it's it's very much like eugenics of the modern day uh, well i mean it's like the eugenics <laughs> of yesteryear as well but it, it's still to, it's to quite see acceptable. that it's quite yeah, acceptable that's, it's, that's the surprising well, thing is just how commonplace it is in, in places like sweden or uh, uh scandinavia well, what well, is it Pro two extensions from this. So one is a mm -hmm. common uh, pro choice sentiment, which is it's for the protection of the mother, because raising a handicapped child severely impacts mm -hmm. the mother. And then the other bit is out of this perceived compassion for the child. Uh, but what? But that's when like your your where your what is it called? Maybe metaphysical. Uh, uh, perspective of abortion comes in, which is, yeah. well, the child already exists, you shouldn't kill it. Mm -hmm. right? Like that's already affecting well, the I, happiness of the child. I think the majority of them, yeah. the, the majority of them are, are due to trisomy twenty one, uh, Down syndrome. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I yeah, it, it it has to do with your opinion on whether or not you think people with Down syndrome are capable of living a happy, a productive, worthwhile life. Yeah, life. yeah. And, and this is kind of where I feel a bit of like admiration towards the hardline stance of, say, the Catholics, who are completely against contraceptives of any kind, uh, e even like in, in donations towards Haiti or places in Africa, which is uh, prevalent with AIDS and things like that. It's like they've taken an extremist stance that. No life, no matter what conditions it is born into, is one in which it would be better for them to have not have existed in. And it, yeah, it, it's, I don't know, very, very much. Well, it's also the stance mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, so it's also the projection that that uh, certain country can adopt the culture of sexual responsibility. That's the other factor here. But it's, so I think that's where it kind of falls down because mm -hmm. the incentives versus disincentives are so different there economically, which is well, mm -hmm. you have to also cater for how high ch uh, child fatalities and things like that have to uh, cater for all these other things that produces that sex. But there is like this, so that's other things. But yeah, like that, what you just said is, uh, it's true because so, then it's like if they adopted that moral stance, then these mm -hmm. economic changes could flow from that. Uh, which something is something I could be, yep. yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, well, something yes. I've considered, <laughs> no, you, ahead, you finish your point, <laughs> okay, it, is that it, it might be the case that um, the people in Africa are, are still kind of running off of the more Victorian era. Uh, type of I, I guess or it's not really Victorian era but it, it, it's like I, I'm not even sure that if given the opportunities of like having contraceptives that it means that they would still be using them because I mean it's still the it's almost like this liberal idea that 
it would be better if there weren't more African children being born into poor homes. And, and so, like, there's this underlying, like, unsaid... Uh, no, it's explicitly stated. It's explicitly yeah, yeah. stated by a number of organizations, not the least of which began with Margaret Sanger mm -hmm. back in the eugenicist that, movement in the early 1900s. Yeah, that it would be better if these poor people weren't having children at all. Yep. And it's like so elitist and frustrating. And it's like... <sighs> yeah. It, 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 I, I guess my point was like, even given the contraceptives and, and opportunities for safe sex, like I'm not so sure that they would still, like they might just like not bother using them because like women still are going to be wanting children. Um, and men are still wanting, going to be wanting to have sex, so there's still going to be prevalent AIDS viruses going about, and women still having children without having uh, strong family foundations there. But that might be, like, a larger tangent away from the main topic, sorry. Well, okay, so inside that, then... Well, I was gone for a long while, and I came back to, uh, I think it was K-pop boy bands, and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's not, yeah, so, okay. But we can tie this in, which is, to some extent, they're being exploited uh, in a way that is somewhat... Like, in some countries, it's directly oppressive. The government will shoot dissenters or shoot uh, people, like, kill them. Uh, like, the warlords of Africa is still, like, a thing. And then there's also the other aspects, which is, okay, so what extent is this social policy done to inhibit uh, people or to avoid responsibility? So, like, in South Africa, like, the calls to evict white farmers without compensation uh, is an issue here. So there's a lot of this type of notion of ordinary men actually happening as well in Africa to then exploit uh, the everyday people or just even, ex yeah, to exploit the everyday people where it's just like, like to some, and I think this is, I think really what we're going to come down to is like all of these things put some collective interest above the individual interest. And so because in doing so, like to believe the collective interest is more important than the individual interest is then to say it's okay to oppress the individual through such a thing as disagreement with the collective interest, right? And it's, it's like, so then we get into a discussion then about, okay, well, what's the, what things is it okay to oppress the individual for? And serial killing is one of the things which, like when you violate you know, and I think every Western country does this. When you violate someone's person, property, or liberty, those are the foundations of a Western society, which is then to say if someone kills you, someone steals from you, or someone mm -hmm. uh, constrains you, then they yeah. are to they are now a detriment. But then when we go further from that, then we end up with philanthropic endeavors, which pits one tribe against another. And it just, like, like... But then how do you navigate that? Because that's a common desire that people have. Like, how do you resolve these desires to fix this collective issue that one demographic is facing compared to another? And it's just like, well, the church and, and institutions of the private sector or, like, the charitable sector try and address this, like the private sector through innovation, charities through compassion, uh, whereas the government just does it through, will steal money from everybody and then with you know through the threat of a gun to then implement what we think is best and it's just like like it's just like uh, how do we like because that's it just seems to be like that's like the where, what the libertarians correctly called out like a hundred years ago now or 200 years ago is just like that force leads to these atrocities because it violates the ability for interpersonal uh, relations to resolve these issues. It now says we have to resolve issues uh, that through the through force, like through governmental force, purely because some people disagree with us. Like it's now the punishment of disagreement when a, a threatening of 
person, property, or liberty, those aren't punishments of disagreement. Those are punishments of oppression or suppression. And it's just like, yeah, like it seems punishment of disagreement is is one of the things here. Like that seems to be like, and Peterson's thing, like, uh, you know, some of Peterson's rules kind of tackle that. Like I can't see where punishing disagreement is something that leads to um, a good outcome. What do you mean by punishment of disagreement? So it's to say that it doesn't matter that you disagree with us. You now have to go along anyway. It's like, you know, or, you know, you disagree with us. You're not ousted from the group. We no longer offer protections to you. Or you disagree mm -hmm. with us. It doesn't matter because we're going to take a gun and then collect your tax money instead. All right. So this is how you fix it. Are you ready? You let people freely associate. That's step one. Step two, you give them the tools to find out who they really are so that when they freely associate, they wind up in groups that make sense to them. Step three, you find a way to equalize the in-group demands for a resource and the capacity to fulfill that resource. Ideally, you situate several groups within a larger setting that can barter or trade various different types of resources that each specific group specializes in so that there is a mutual benefit. Right? And even more ideally, these are kind of like meta goals, each region or specific group of people should specialize in a particular role that functions or has some utility for the wider setting. And that setting could be a nation state or just an environment in general. Mm -hmm. This so. kind of brings in, in, in like what I was considering you know, or talking about in, in reference to having a larger drive towards localism rather than towards the nationalism or globalism of expansion for mm -hmm. a, like a wide amount of people all within the same space. And, and I know like through Mormonism that there was, they, along with say like the Amish and the Mennonites, they've actually like set up, um, segre not segregated, but secluded off like, um, kind of in group, uh, societies, right? Like in Utah, they have kind of their own, <laughs> I don't want to say compounds, but, yeah, Something those are those are that, right? unofficial schisms. Uh, yeah, those are those are not mm. um, claimed oh, okay. by the church. Let's say now they yeah. did have they did have some historically. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, there are a number of settlements. And if you look at the the Southwest and in fact um, much of Western Canada as well, all of that was mm -hmm. settled by the Mormons. Strangely enough, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and even northern Mexico. But uh, yeah, a number of satellite uh, colonies sprung up in Mexico shortly after the uh, polygamous ban in order to continue that practice. And there mm. were a few more that cropped up in states like Colorado and southern Utah, and they've kind of persisted to this day. But those were all disavowed uh, very shortly after the ban on polygamy, and most of them ended up in, well, mm. the state oh, that so you see them as it <laughs> now. And uh -huh. So all of those uh, compounds were polygamous societies then all, all of them yep every single one gotcha. they were established okay. to maintain the polygamy culture and um mm -hmm. it was against the will of the church for, uh, in some cases in other cases it was it's hard to say if it was against the will of the church it was maybe it was being done behind the, the back who knows but in in all cases very shortly afterwards it was completely disavowed because it, it was coming quite ugly right it was quite apparent that the polygamy mm. was it was not working out the way it was being yeah. done where it was but anyhow so yeah I guess so there are obvious... still through that huh. no go ahead sorry no wait <laughs> oh, I, I, the, the funny thing that you had mentioned when i was visiting with you is how mormons were able to uh, identify other mormons just based off of uh seeing their faces and right. it's funny because like I, I met up with a couple of other Mormons so they brought up the same thing it was like I had no idea it's such a huge thing and I guess because like there's some 
uh, specific like secret, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, not adaptation, but a specific well, the, the, uh, epi- the study that uh-huh. the study that looked mm-hmm. into it uh, noted that it was probably something to do with complexion. Mm. Um, and their best guess was that it was because there was a common um, uh, lack of use of certain things like caffeine or alcohol or cigarettes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. that, that might have an effect on complexion. Wait, but- so wouldn't it, wouldn't it also explain. be because some men also produce so many of the population? Because generally, like, one man would then have, like, 200 children. So it's just like, well, they would all inherit features of that man. Oh, oh no. Yeah, there there were some fairly successful families. But, no, this is this is modern day, and this would include things like converts and people that are on. So you think it, it, it could be, like, an epigenetic, like, uh, change, like, certain genes that aren't being uh, uh, turned on. And so that might ha- have some sort of visual tell from that lack of a gene or, or positive gene. So what I, are I all didn't the say that. That, that could be the case. I, yeah, the, the okay. study itself was just making the claim that, or, or making the, the, the guess that uh-huh. uh, it had something to do with complexion and something to do with dietary or other strict uh, laws that were altering that complexion to improve it of some kind. Because well, the, okay. The, hmm? well, what about the other way, which is that <laughs> so, controversial idea here? I don't know why. What if it was that uh, certain genetic uh, things that also have certain correlations, not particularly genetic correlations, but just coincidental correlations with certain physical features? predispose people to then seek out well the here's church. all right let me let me give you a little bit more of this study just so you don't keep reaching <laughs> uh you could reach forever without this so here's what they did is they, they they slowly removed the details from the faces until the only thing they had left was just a very strange outline with no eyes no real nose no real mouth and just a kind of like forehead cheek chin blob and yet they were still able to reliably predict, I think it was on the order of like 78% or something crazy like that, uh, <laughs> who was a Mormon, who wasn't, right? So the yeah, only no, thing but, that remained was like this. Hmm? But to figure out whether it was what I just said or whether or not it was what uh, they're proposing is what duration of converts are there? Because if they've been there for like five years, then it would allow the epigenetic conversion to take place. However, oh, if oh, in per, the initial like individual, oh, um, yeah. no. So if yeah. if in the initial like if they also found out that people who had joined Mormonhood within and you know they factored in the duration of the Mormon thing and found out even people within one month of joining also had that particular look or semblance, then that would also that well that yeah, would rule that would out be, that. I'm pretty sure yeah. that would be an un, yeah. You you wouldn't be able to factor that out because. Mm-hmm. Uh, you'd have to follow the genetic lines of the individual regardless of whether or not they were a convert because you didn't know whether or not they had crossed back into the church at some point at the family tree, depending on how long you wanted to look yeah. into it. So no, but, you, know, but you probably just have to the... ignore that one. Well, well, also within Mormonism, it's most people that uh, are Mormon are people that are like second generation or or are, are born into Mormonism rather. Correct. I mean, there, yeah. there's a large amount of like evangelism within Mormonism, but because of how many children the are had. Surpasses the, yeah. The, yeah. The, but, but, yeah. So most Mormons you meet are going to be people that weren't necessarily uh, brought in, but probably true. were born in. Most yeah. just based on office statistics and averages. I, but that's just affirmation for the epigenetic uh, argument kind of thing. But because uh, mm-hmm. it can't rule out, because if you do have that factoring in, and it turned out that converts, recent converts, also had the similar facial features, then it would then say that there are certain genetic traits in the broad spectrum of society that led people to become Mormons. It's the glow of the spirit, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> they see they see the aura of fellow Mormons within them. That well, so it. this is what's so interesting about it. That's the. I mean, you can call that the metaphorical language of the literal truth, something like that, right? Like whatever the literal mm-hmm. truth is, who knows? But there is something there that's being researched that people have noticed. I mean, the reason it's being researched is because 
Mormons themselves noticed when they looked around like, oh, I, I, I bet that's a Mormon, right? When they see somebody in the store and they go up and walk up and they go, oh, it is, of course. <laughs> and it happened right way more often than not. And so this ended up being a question that some researcher at some Utah yeah, school wanted to look into. So it, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, it's kind of funny because there's like a similar uh, aspect of social signaling that occurs within like Judaism where like people wearing the kippah, that's an mm. indication to fellow Jews like, hey, I, I, I'm one of you guys. Uh, and but that, that's more an outward sacrifice as well for like uh, or, or not sacrifice, but it, a yeah, it, an example of like keeping within the social uh, structure, uh, like subordinating yourself so that people realize, oh, this is somebody that's actually going to play by the rules here. Well, that type of wearing the little hats is also what SJWs call for, which is, well, is pretty much what SJWs do when they virtue signal. Like the little hat is a virtue signal. And SJWs do that all the time. They, they then uh, verbally virtue signal. I support maxim, 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 maxim. Right? Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. therefore you know that they're in an in-group and they're against a particular out-group. And so yep. that's like a main role of code of conduct to then say, hey, don't worry, we're part of the in-group that you are, right? Yeah. Which no, is we're against, we're for these things and we're against these things. I think we have to draw a distinction between people who are uh, just looking to establish themselves in-group and people who are looking to uh, boost their own personal image for this moral outrage thing they do. I, I, there seems to be a clear difference between like a, a kind of normal group in group preference behavior and this kind of exaggerated uh, selfish assumption of moral self-righteousness, right? Like it seems to be two different things. I, I think there's probably a little bit of both in there. I mean, that was one of Jesus's kind of critiques of the Pharisees was how they have their, their tassels long and their, uh, uh, what is the thing, the, 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 the scriptures that they put on their foreheads large, like it, it's an expression of their own. You didn't want to say phylacteries. I, I didn't, I forget. I didn't know what it was, it was called really. I'm not that involved with the more orthodox Judaism. Um, but, but yeah, it, 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 it's, it certainly can be used in either way. Uh, like I, I definitely noticed like so there's that social signaling or virtue signaling of the I voted sticker that's always posted on uh, in, uh, any social media during election times or things like that for people to indicate, hey, I, I'm I'm doing my part and give me encouragement for, for doing this or something like that, which I, 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 I'm kind this of is... with, with Ben, I, I kind of abhor any type of virtue signaling and it just frustrates me. This is one of my favorite new virtue signals, by the way, the, uh, the, the youth in this country are very fond of saying, or the ones that hope to be political activists, especially the ones that came out of the Parkland shooting, like David Hogg, like to say things like, mm. if you don't do what I want, I'm not going to vote for you. <laughs> and so what they're doing is it's, it's like, it's no different than if you don't play the way I want to play, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. Right. They're, they're using this <laughs> vote as a resource that they're denying the politician. Right. Like it, it, it's really funny. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. there, there's such a level of impotence there. Right. Like they, they, it's like they perceive they have such power and it's almost nothing. And it's, it's yeah. all wasted on resentment. I think, I think it's especially funny when it's like somebody that's liberal saying that they voted when they live in, within a liberal community. So it's like, I mean, yeah, it's, it's I mean, <laughs> your, your state's going to be voting one way anyway. So it's like, it doesn't make that much of a difference, but. Yeah, I wasted my time today. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Not a reference really makes sense in uh in Australia though, because we uh 
we generally vote independently and then ha- end up with hung governments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Australia, it's mandatory voting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Unless you are, are a JW, uh, then you can get let off. Um, mm. But, yeah, otherwise you get fined. And um, But we also had the set. This is something that was really funny. I was uh, talking to my partner uh, yesterday. And uh, we. do you guys know about Jedi listing your religion as Jedi for census? Was this a thing in America? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so is in Australia... Like the Pastafarianism, where yeah, people yeah, are just it's doing it ironically? Having a, having a gaff. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so like, uh, the census came around in 2001, uh, 70,000 people in Australia declared themselves as the member of the Jedi Order of the census. Yeah, so 0.37%. Like passed around on 4chan for a little while or something. Yeah. <laughs> New Zealand, it ended up uh, becoming the, the second most popular religion at 1.5%. It's quite England. England, in, uh, England and Wales got 390,000 people, 0.8% of the population to do it. I don't know, man. So, I'll take a haka over sheep any day. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it had that much of an impact in the USA because there isn't anything about this. It just seems like it was the uh, the British colonies that really did this. But uh, yeah, I think it's um, you know that's like uh, it's kind of like a a, a rejection or virtue signaling, uh, like the same with the like to say Jedi Knight kind of stuff. It's just like kind of throw out the game. I think that's, I guess, uh, what transgender activists are doing with the, like the non-binary. They're kind of saying, "I throw out the game," being categorized. Um, yeah. So there's this really interesting phenomenon. I, I've I brought it up before, where we, where you can, where you can look at culture and you can see two distinct sets of cultural traditions being passed down: one that exists in the adult realm and one that exists in the child realm. And and that's like growing up as a child. That's that's how you perceive it. You see like what the adults are doing and it's this other place. It's this, this other territory, other responsibilities and duties and rituals that you don't even really have an interest in, right? Like you might have a passing connection to, but most of the time you end up drawn to and and interacting with other children and participating in this other cultural layer that exists at that level of games that you pass back and forth and jokes you tell each other and there's this distinct setup right but what part of what's happening right now i think especially in the complexity of our modern era is that children it's kind of a peter pan syndrome children are are refusing to adopt the responsibility of of the, the social circumstance that was kind of passed to them by their parents, right? It's a full rejection of the the social inheritance. That's what progressivism is when taken to the extremes, a 100% rejection of everything that was handed to you and just building something new. So, right? so I, there's, this, there's this barrier between growing up from child to adult, right? And if, if the adult land seems too uh, loathsome, right? If it seems like it's too horrific i think there's this suppression of the desire for the child to uh to grow up and then becomes this kind of rebellious critique and this starts at a very young age by the way if you're raising children you notice this right away children are naturally inclined to want to say no and rebel so i wonder if in the process of creating a society that develops a place or roles for most people if it has something to do with this inversion or separation of cultural traditions something that produces a more desirable maturation process so i think this gives us two things to run with uh so the first one that's okay so we've got the the desire for social cohesion creates atrocities. Then we also have the one that, oh, okay. So John, I think the desire for local communities or you know constraining things to localities doesn't solve the problem because then it kind of also exemplifies tribalism to an extent. 
uh, because then it's just like each local community then become like, so yeah, if you allow every community to self-organize for complete freedom, then people would then gravitate to the, com the community that they feel. But then it quickly, there will then become, you know, this community versus this community versus this community, because now the community is a direct reflection of, you know, someone's self-actualization. It's now destroys the necessity for two people within a community to battle out their opinions and so they can just flee to whichever one they agree with, which is like why America mm -hmm. has these super liberal centers. I, then these I think that's true. I think that's centers. absolutely true, but only in the presence of a lack of a, of a, of a shared religious substrate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause like America people can, if they have the same shared religious substrate or philosophical substrate, they, they can still have uh, arguments within that substrate, like it, kind of resorting back, like they both work off of the same axioms for like, say the scientific method or something like that uh, for understanding truth. And then they can both use that in order to uh, like make points against each other. It, 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 yeah. there, there would still be the arguments and, and but yes you're, you're right in, in instances where somebody is I'm working off a completely different worldview than you um, it, it, there would be yeah it, I wouldn't be able to fit within the community because I'm not accepting the dogmas of the, the rest of the, the of the, the group the like prerequisite axioms for the tribe yeah. yeah. Well, if the if the foundation is the same, right? If the bedrock is the same, then the thing that you both fall back to is the same. And and right, like no matter what cultural differences accumulate over separation of distance. So, for instance, me and Texans. I'm over in Florida, but but uh, a thousand miles or or maybe nine hundred miles or so uh, west of me into Texas on I-10 is a fairly different individual, right? There's a there's a whole cultural mystique that surrounds texas they have their slogans for their state everything's bigger in texas right like they have they have a they have a uh they have a particular type of person that likes to live there right brash independent there's this sense of who they are there's a sense of who floridans are and on the internet it's florida man i find that hilarious <laughs> but uh there's there's this sense right and people kind of do sort of gravitate, especially in urban centers, right? Lots of people move to New York to be in New York because of New York, right? And that's the only reason. Or they move to LA to be in LA because of LA, right? There is this kind of free gravitation and change, but. But uh, to your point, Ben, uh, I'm, I recognize that there are issues with tribalism when the tribes are interacting with one another. Uh, that's why I, I, I'm more steering towards considering of like the Amish and the Mennonite communities, things like that, where they are kind of secluded from everyone else. And there are definitely like problems w with those types of systems, but it's not a competition between like Amish versus Mennonites, whereas like in instances of like that certainly was the case in like Catholics versus Protestants in uh, uh, Scotland, and uh, yeah, very well, much I, a problem. Mm -hmm. well, Sorry, I I, hold on. Let me let me finish my point real quick because I, I oh okay I yeah this. right. Uh, the the underlying so this the, the idea is that me and the, the guy in Texas are, are radically different in terms of not radically different but fairly different in terms of perspective. But we're both fundamentally capable of communicating and dealing with each other and especially in terms of commerce and other re respects because of a shared uh, kind of christian cultural heritage and then the upbringing of of this country the whole country itself and that there is this and th this is where the nationalism part comes in this patriotic nationalism that underlies this relationship no matter what kind of arguments i have with this individual that says well we should work it out because we are part of this deeper more foundational uh, connection right and so it's kind of like is it like biologically speaking it's like every organ in my body shares the same foundational linear sequence of you know uh nucleic acids in my dna but 
multiple levels of hierarchical structure on top of that um, also coordinate uh, right. in, in vast differences, but but are capable of doing so because of the unity that exists in the cohesion of the the lower level, right? Like, right. Well, then it uh, falls into kind of the earlier Peterson's uh, talking points, which was, you know, what's what is God and what's the difference with God and or religion and ideology, and it's more or less that the chap capital, uh, well, God is the uh, the rule set, like the most uh, limited ethos that constrain. Sorry, the most limited telos, like the most limited. Uh, ideal that then allows all the other ideologies, religions, and everything to kind of coincide peacefully. So it's like this super shared foundation. And where, so like if you view your God as porn, then you're going to be ruled by that. So you want to get the most abstract, high level God that then allows the interaction with as large of a, a community as you can, which would then be. Uh, it seems through history that that is the respect for the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so yeah, there, there's a, a a good point. Like, it, could humanism, the the love, the the shared love for humanity, be a sufficient uh, secular religion to take the place of the the religions of the past, or it's something akin to it, humanism? It, uh -huh. Yeah, which is what objectivism is kind of like, you know, a worshipping of man's spirit or man's creative spirit, which is the, uh, you know, that's pretty much Rand's God, right? Um, uh, if um, which was, I've met online or any example of the general humanist, I would say absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, it's weak. Yeah, this is why I, I want to avoid anything that could be close to common enemy identity politics. Because while it's not a prerequisite of the ideology itself, uh, I do see a lot within the communities of atheism of primarily just complaining about religious people. Uh, and it's, it's like, I would much rather be hearing uh, atheists actually talking about their, their specific field of study that they're involved within rather than just bad <laughs> religious people all the time. And, and so I, I definitely see that there within a lot of, a lot of the atheist and uh, anti-theist crowds, there is that enemy identity politics that's out there. Within objectivism, there's a certain, well, I guess it, it might just be part of its creed is the uh, rejection of altruism in its entirety uh, or because it does not align with the the selfish interests of the individual, which uh, it there's a well, certain aspect also, of. Well, uh -huh. so here's here's my problem mm -hmm. with objectivism. Mainly, it only works in a completely free society. Plus, if I if I was to like completely weigh out what would be the best for my own rational self-interest. I could not see how having children would be a necessity. There might be instances, like there certainly would be people that see it they're like, okay, I am more biologically happier by having children. And so I'm going to have children. And then I can make this world into a world which I would want my children to be living in. But viewed purely rationally self-interestedly, I can't see how family is a uh, primary ideal or anything like that. But I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a... Uh, a mm -hmm. You need to watch some more anime. <laughs> <laughs> anime is an objectivist? What are you talking about? <laughs> no, I mean in terms of the family thing. Okay, so... Uh, the, the one that I watched recently was, uh, uh, I think it's like, the subtitle is like a story that leads to the Antarctica. I think it's like on the edge of the universe or something like that, like it's four girls. But the, the takeaway from this TV show, which is really interesting, is at least within 
the culture that was projected from this TV show, like the takeaway that I guess I wanted you to get is that these girls overruled the desires of an individual when they perceived weakness in the vid individual. So it's like where the social unit was respect. So the friend group was uh, something which the individuals per perceived themselves as weak and the social unit as stronger. So they were stronger together than individually. Um, so when one then was stubborn, the social unit actually overruled that stubbornness to then provide a better outcome. And it was, it's really uh, fascinating that sounds, because that's... That sounds um, anti-objectivist. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, but I'm just saying for the point of a family, right, or the point of a wife, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. so it's this idea that, so like, I, and that's the, the surprising thing, which is this conception is like in the West, it's just like the individual should be the strongest unit. And that, like, as soon as we kind of consider our partner to be affecting our own opportunities, we divorce. Whereas with this unit and what Peterson espouses about family or, you know, marriage is that this is something in which case you should view the benefits of the social unit as something that benefits you more than it takes. Uh, so, you know, through your wife or your husband, you're able to, you know, like, they should be a training ground for you to deal with your insufficiencies to make you a better person. And like children, uh, you know, the, the raising of a children uh, requires like some type of, you know, it's like a balance because how much are you a tyrant and how much are you a facilitator? And that's a very hard line to draw. Uh, so, but it's more like, okay, I think it's more the family needs kind of results from like an inbred desire to coexist with someone. Uh, but again, like Ayn Rand's, like at least her characters in the books, they were uh, quite interesting in their choice of relations, uh, to say the least. But even Ayn Rand herself, like she uh, uh, had uh, consensual affairs, like it was an open marriage, and she valued truth uh, quite extensively. And didn't um, and have children either. Yeah. But I wonder about that but because that, that's also about, probably due to her temperament. Like she was hardly a <laughs> woman's type of woman, more of a yeah. man's man, <laughs> really, <laughs> or a man's like a, a yeah. man's trapped within a woman's body or something like that. Well, it's a little bit interesting, right? Because I think her version of femininity, the idea was distinct to her. Like she wasn't saying women should act like men. It was quite different, which was, well, to some extent, it's very hard to draw that line. Like, Dominic was certainly not the same as Rourke. So in the mm -hmm. book of yeah. ideals, right, like, they are distinct figures. So the feminine was the one that made the masculine powerful. And then in, in response to that, like, the masculine, I, I'm not really sure what the masculine provided to the feminine besides a, a unit of respect and Restraint. Or desire. Restraint. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's order. Uh, it's order imposed on chaos. Like, see, the right. chaos of the feminine is emotion, and the emotion and of the collapse of the Soviet Union under the weight of the torture of servitude is what she carried around in her head. And the only way, the only way to control that, is through logic. Right, because the, the only way to suppress that was through. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But it's also interesting to tie this back to the sex transmutation part, the bit at the end, which was that men are governed by the desire to please women. And you think about Rand's temple to the human spirit, which in the middle of it was Dominic Francone and uh, a naked, you know, her naked in the temple. So the whole unit of order and structure and beauty and uh, excellence was devoted to the image of the ideal woman and i think mm -hmm. that's uh mm -hmm. that's fascinating and yeah yeah uh, it's very archetypal i love the fountainhead it's very archetypal yeah. uh, John, yeah, my biggest objective is uh, um, uh, oh uh, sorry like it's like a scratching on your microphone uh, I'm not sure where your microphone's positioned, but it's kind of like a little scratching. When I'm speaking or, or all the time? Uh, all the time. Okay, I'll, I'll change it.
Um, okay, okay. So what were the two points we raised? Okay, there was the... Okay, so the, the, there was your three-step program, Tyler, of, you know, ways to solve this issue. And I think what you outlined was to move from social engineering to social... Uh, away from social engineering to what social independence maybe or social uh self social, social awareness yeah i think it's social more awareness. like just awareness and then yeah. building an environment that allows people to utilize that newfound awareness in a meaningful way because what's yeah. what's going on is that we're 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 converging on this really unique point where we have a profound understanding of what we are as a human being from a number of number of different perspectives like from a biological perspective and from a psychological one like never before have you ever been able to read the collective works of Jung online right like all this stuff is kind of converging and so we're getting a sense of who we are and and with that information we can use it to make life more meaningful right and and part of that is building a society that interacts well and doesn't have a bunch of room for screw ups so I think we've got the technological side of things uh, to help us build those aspects that will allow us to better shape this new awareness of who we are. I just want to so, Sorry, continue. Yeah, as this is final point. Um, so the the three points I outlined were essentially the the beginnings of the Republican uh, the Republic the Democratic Republic here in the United States is the, the creation of the federal state in cooperation with the local uh, state is this division up is kind of like a division of specialization and resource and bartering across borders and such. Right. And in fact, it's why it's worked out so well for so long, I think. And any, any countries that adopt anything similar to it probably benefit from it. Uh, but we've we've reached a point where it's becoming increasingly obvious, I think, that um, that that the association of peoples is essentially coming down to city and rural, so urban and rural split. And right, like that doesn't seem to be very healthy, um, particularly because the uh, the, the, the laws that govern the city and the state are the same, all right? So there isn't really any, uh, there's, a, there's a serious tension and conflict there rather than something like the conflict between the state and federal level. Right. I just want to read out uh, this bit about Dominic Francon while we were on that topic. So Dominic Francon is the her heroine of The Founding Head, described by Rand as the woman for a man like Howard Rourke. Rand described Dominic as similar to herself in a bad mood. <laughs> for most of the novel, the character operates from what Rand viewed as wrong ideas, believing that she values, believing that the values she admires cannot survive in the real world. She chooses to turn away from them so that the world cannot harm her. Only at the end of the novel does she accept that she can be happy and survive. And I think this is like the mother, like it's interesting, like this is a mother bear turning in of itself. Right, which is the uh, the thing she protects cannot survive, so she wishes to destroy them. Right, um, and in doing so, like uh, at least through her relationship with Rourke, then she tries and destroys Rourke because she views Rourke as too valuable to win. And uh, in doing so, it only kind of proves as a testament to Rourke's ability, as well as um, makes Rourke stronger in of himself. Um, which is interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, that's what I mean. Like when you talk to like leftist people and then like, oh, Rad was a terrible writer. Or it was a waste of time. And like, I just kind of feel like they're uh, like, you're not like the book, but I mean, like you can't just say that these were bad books. Like, yeah, well, it's the, the problem is that they, they lack the ability to discriminate. They, they've they've just got this binary sense of judgment. It's good or bad. 
They, they yeah. have not been taught to discriminate. They well, I think I, I mean, that's, that's certainly true about like Fountainhead because that's like an idealistic archetypal story. Whereas Atlas Shrug, it, uh, you know, the characters develop and change and grow when, you know, change the beliefs because they get tested so much. Whereas in Fountainhead, no one, well, his, Rourke's uh, comrades change. Um, like the uh, painter who he contracts, like there's significant growth in the side characters, but there's not significant growth. As well as in Peter Keating, uh, he changes a lot in that book, as well as his wife. Um, but right. none of the main character, like the, none of the archetypical characters. But I mean, that's kind of makes sense, which is you have the hero, the heroine, and the devil uh, in, uh, and then you have all the side pawns that get abused by them or, you know, uh, exalted. Well, I think um, it, it, it also helps support her main contention that the, the progress of humanity is, is done by these, these heroic individuals, right? So the, it's only natural that the people around him would represent the individuals who would bend to his unyielding will, right? So he's not the one that changes the people around him are as they adopt yeah. his salvation. Yeah. Whereas, like, uh, in Atlas Shrugged, it's more like, you know, all the characters are learning as they go. Like, there is a John, there's like a godlike figure in Atlas Shrugged, which is John Gold. Mm -hmm. uh, but even him, he only has Gold? his, he only has his, <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah, that's a joke for people who've read uh, Atlas Shrugged. But um, there's the, uh, uh, yeah, so, like he has a transformation uh at you know halfway through the book but uh he's also a character who has this magnificent transformation um which is interesting because i think like atlas shrugged is kind of like the book talking about those sleepers like the the true sleeper the one who awakens like circumstances are yeah. created to then cause them to awaken against the tyranny yeah definitely that, that's exactly what she was. No. Yeah. So in order for objectivism to really flourish, it would need to either only exist for a population of people that are highly disagreeable or it expand their philosophy somehow to envelop those that are higher in agreeableness because that seems to be the, the the problem with objectivism is it only spreads towards those that are already like temperamentally uh predisposed pre predisposed towards uh this personality type already as far yeah. as i perceive it Mm. Uh, well, I think it's like the United States Constitution, like the United States uh, with its initial formation, like Pennsylvania was formed by the Quaker William Penn, who, you know, it was a very libertarian society in that initial setup. And then the Constitution was kind of like established, which people were fairly uh, libertarian uh, with that initial Constitution. And then over time, uh, as things do, then uh like i wonder about like the conversion that has happened in the united states because like you know like at least common like people from the objectivist community viewed the golden age of the united states as this libertarian thing and then it, it was then corrupted by group interests um instead which then affected it like over the last hundred years um they're like even Thomas Sowell says that where he's just like, you know, once the slaves were freed and people were granted uh, things then people had maximum independence and they did better. And it was only until like the 1950s that things started changing for the worse when the government started becoming philanthropical uh, and started concerning itself with group interests rather than things that benefited all individuals. Um, so, but I, yeah, th there's the the need for people like the objectivists because they're the ones that aren't going to put up with any type of bullshit and they're the ones that are actually going to be like the founding fathers and like uh like say no to taxes and found their own new nation in order to do that but that's the thing like 
at any instance of something like being told to do something that they don't like, they're going to rebel and, and fractionate out further and further away from uh, uh, other people. Well, maybe this is one of the things which is maybe that's what Rand. Well, it's so hard because, like, that was a summary of Atlas Shrugged, right? Which was that the only option is to starve them from the tyranny of you by striking and setting up your own uh, fragmented community to then build a new. So it's like to starve the parasite of its food so it dies and you can continue uh, pure. But then it's hard because. Then it's just saying, like, you know, say if code of conduct start becoming uh, overly altruistic, uh, where they put collective interests over the interpersonal, then you, it's to then say you're better off just setting up your own community. But then what you do is you remove those 5% of dissenters, like going back to ordinary man, you remove that 5% of vocal dissenters. So then you only have those which are then influenced by those 30% of cruel people or exploitive people. Um, and I think that that's a worse outcome. And like, to some extent, that was the hardest thing about Atlas Shrugged for me to accept, which was Hank Reardon's desire or, for conversion to, because Hank Reardon desired to fight within the system. Uh, he viewed that as honorable. And it was only until like the very end, he actually ended up caving to John Galt's desire for, um, for migrating. Um, to a strike situation. And uh, it's hard because I think it's more about, like, because that's kind of the culture war that is happening, which is uh, libertarians kind of fight and then they get exiled or they get suffocated. Like, they kind of get forced to leave. And I think when that happens, then it causes the left behind society to kill itself. Because it's just right, kind of on. like a society tries and... All right, hold on. I got it. I've got it. Radical okay. idea. Radical idea. Okay. It's quite clear that uh, like when things get really bad, the best thing to do is just get up and leave, right? I think that's how America was started. Just get up and go. <laughs> Britain, we don't want your shit anymore. We start a new country. Yeah, that's what happened with uh, the pioneers. They went west, right? That's what independence drives, the, the exploratory sense to go forth and make your own way, right? All right, so the problem is we don't have anywhere to go anymore. All right, Mars, but that's only for Elon and the hyper-rich. So here's what we do. We chop up we chop up countries into like twos or threes, and then we do we do population rotation, kind of like crop rotation. And every time a population just gets fed up with all their shit, they get up and move to a new spot and build something new. Would that spot like already be empty or would there be like the other, the rest of the population was there in that spot? Yeah. Who knows? Maybe you could, uh, you could play around with that part of it. I mean, maybe there's plenty of like erect Roman temporary uh, structures or Canada and Australia. But who's it going to be wanting to move there? No, this I just is mean, such a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of bad ideas, but you know. wait, well, because this is like exactly that type of social engineering thing we just warned about, where it's just like, 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 like it's what we're doing with the Jews, essentially. No, no, no. Which is like, hey, let's move you from here to here to here to here. No, 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 no. Like, it's not. It's not making people do it. That's, that's. I mean, that's what I mean by structuring the environment for it's. It's voluntarism, right? Like, like you, it's noticing the behavior of people that they they constantly need to go somewhere, right? So, the only thing you'd really have to do is just kind of exclude people from one part of the land. That's all, right? And then at some point, you kind of open the gates and. Wait. Okay. So what what you're saying is you'd have uh, like, a, you'd have like a, a threshold criteria, right? So like when social unease reaches a certain amount, the floodgates open. And all of the entrepreneurial and industrial types will leave and flood into the new zone and they'll build up a new civilization and all the people that have become hedonistic and lazy and right. you know, apathetic will die in the slums of the old. And this is how civilizations are reborn instead of 
the slow dissolution into barbarians taking you over or civil war conflict outcome that usually happens right to avoid right. that what so so what this just then sounds like immigration as well as fleeing from your country's problems to become a refugee somewhere else but it's it's, it's founding a new country over and over again within the boundary of the same country <laughs> it uh it's crop rotation it seems okay, like a lot of wasted energy <laughs> sorry it, it, okay well i'm saying this is to divert from the wasted energy of like civilizational collapse which is what ordinarily happens yeah but but okay well okay yeah, well, I mean, like we have this in the Middle East, right? We just destabilize that area through the wills of United Nations, and then you know, then just continuously screw over that area's ability to uh, form a united government, and then you then have it, you know, ruled by then tyranny, which then causes people to then uh, continue no, to bring their culture no, no, elsewhere. No, that is not our fault. There, no way, no way. What? Like we've made it worse with the oil thing for sure. But that nonsense has been going on for 1,400 years now. Like, yeah. the destabilization and tyranny and killing each other has been going on for 1,400 years there now. Like, there's, they don't need any help. Uh, 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 yeah, 1,400 years, man. 1,400 years now they have been fighting over that land. Like, it's, it's not been pretty. Yeah. No. Well. So I, yeah. Well, I, I think we can. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. The my point doesn't really hedge on that. That's it, true. It, it, it seems okay. So it might work now within modern times and how resources are very much more digitally based rather than physically based, uh, but. I, I, I'm not. I'm not 100% serious like about localizing. this. You guys are treating this way too serious. Yeah, no, it, it's it's <laughs> okay. going to be something like this, though. I, it doesn't necessarily have to be whole swaths of the population moving, but there's there's something to the notion of renewal, right? The there's some scenario, though, just like all all the workers will go to their seasteading place and create a new. Well, place. okay, right. so I don't think okay, so. The Atlas Shrugged, right, was where there was repression of the interests of the libertarians to then the point where the libertarians had no option but to leave because leeches were preventing them from exalting the actualization. Now, but I think there's so much to be done before that situation arises, which is that sense of renewing the horror story can happen. Like it should that's that you know it shouldn't require civilization uh, civilizations collapse for there to be a renewal that renewal should take part every single day in our everyday activities and everyday social groups which is part of well let's actually listen to everybody uh and rather than censor anyone um because as soon as you start censoring then you risk going off a cliff um into a destruction and you then cause people to have to move out. Whereas if you listen to everyone, then it forces people, like it then allows individual renewal as well as societal renewal um, by listening to people. Yeah, I just, I, I, I think what I'm proposing is something radically different because when you do the same things, the patterns repeat. And so partly I'm assuming that patterns are going to repeat so that the behavior in humans is repetitious and that there's some fundamental underlying biological drives that are guiding our behavior like tribalism, right? And so it, I, partly when, you, when I'm thinking about what it is for a stable future scenario is, is that it's an acknowledgement of that underlying drive and also the hope that that can be constrained somehow using some novel means, right? Some new situation that produces an outcome that we haven't quite seen before in the same way that writing 
uh, as a technological improvement produced history, right? Whereas before it was just an, a vapor of events that were never recorded and where other technological advancements have made like kind of dramatic shift in our capacity to evolve beyond a certain level of morality, right? So you could never have discussions like we're having right now without the advent of technology. We, we would never have the nuance and understanding and subtle multicultural perspective that could occur between an American and or a couple of Americans and an Aussie regarding all these various viewpoints, like without all the benefit of the time that we could sit here because of increased production in food and the you know, amazing communication technology, all that stuff's produced the environment that allows us to elevate our moral discrimination to uh, um, a higher plane, right? So I, I, I th I'm trying to think of ways to do that. I'm trying to think of configurations of the environment that will produce a more stable, energetic routine. So I think I'm going to crop cycling populations. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I'm going to head off because I, I got some stuff I want to finish. But before I do, I'll um, be sure to uh, shout out to a video that I'm currently uploading now uh, on the topic of metaphorical truth that oh. I went through. And I've been working on it for a little bit. So once it, at least it's uploaded, it'll be up there for people to go through and critique and enjoy. Right. And I'll hopefully get something out of it. You need a but, you need to call your uh, YouTube channel John Buck rather than it being quad something something something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm using my other YouTube channel that I have, which is writer John Buck. Or actually, I think it's just John Buck. So you're right. Yeah. Because uh, because whenever you post comments on these videos, it's always quad, and it was just like just just use the John Buck one. So people would know yeah. who this is. That's the thing though. My quad one has my YouTube Red account tied to it. So like anything that I'm going to be watching videos on, I'm going to be using that one, so I don't have to watch commercials. Right. But yeah, I'll I'll be using this one for sure for all uploads, and it's closer tied to my Twitter name, so that's good. All righty, cool. Uh, All right. well, at the Talk to you guys later. Link in the mm -hmm. description when it's uh, when it's ready. Later, sure. John. <laughs> See you guys. All right. Uh, yeah. So I think. Well, I think we can also like you know, there's the saying like history tends to repeat itself until I guess innovation breaks it out of the water, right? Or you know, destroys the rules of the game. But then. But I also think there's so much improvements that can be offered to the cycle of history of governance through like the utilization of technology. We don't have to particularly experiment with new forms of governance. So for instance, like liquid democracy, uh, trying to move uh, governments to part volunteers that implement policies, which are then voted through delegation by a population, which are then provided on terms. Like I have this, uh, blog post called, I think, a uh, government run by volunteers or so, um, detailing that. Like, there's a lot that can be done through governments to kind of do that. But I think, like, for trying to solve, like, the ordinary men situation, and I think mostly, uh, you know, if we just leave that uh, idea aside, I think specifically the... I, okay, well, so for the questions that we have, we've got how to structure society. Um, how to prevent the ramp up to a society where such discrimination is possible, how we are risking the same today, and what manifestations of ordinary men are happening today. So, okay, what manifestations of ordinary men are happening today? Any time when they put the collective interest above the individual interest. Uh, I think that's the reasonable answer for that. Uh, how will we, so how to prevent the ramp up to a society where such discrimination is possible? Well, we need to reduce collective interest. Um, which is individualism and, you know, that, and so how are we risking the same today was well, not listening to dissenters, it's not taking them on board because, and people like code of conducts don't listen to dissenters because they're protecting this collective, the, 
the interests of this fictional collective rather than letting adults actually sort things out interpersonally. Um, yeah, adults. <laughs> so mm. it's, uh, so I think, uh, and then how to structure society while well, we have, you know, there's thing, major improvements that can be made, which would be liquid democracy. And like, so there is like this idea of, oh, we can just set up our own little community, but then, you know, you just, you're just, uh, that doesn't really seem to solve the problem of a desire to listen to each other. It just, it's just no, like, oh, it just, just removes you sorry. from the, it's, it's the same thing that's going on with Brexit. The, the big contention is the fact that isolating themselves also removes them from some really important considerations and conversations regarding economic activity and laws and such. So you make your own little community, but if you still live in a land that has laws that you don't have any control over now or say in because you've isolated yourself, it's just, it's not a viable long-term scenario. Yeah, because I, I, that's, cause I think Alice shrugged in this idea of this strike was a hypothetical solution. Uh, because at that point, like, it's also when did they do the strike? And they did the strike when they could no longer really, like, there was really no other option besides widespread destruction. Um, so they did a strike to then, you know, make the society eat its medicine as quickly as possible so everyone could get on with the work. Uh, whereas I think if, you know, you're doing a strike too early, then it removes the ability to utilize society's resources um, to, you know, the, you know, the benefits of yourself and, you know, all the things you care about. Um, so I think it's only when, you know, destruction is inevitable, a strike makes sense. Yeah, well, for certain... For certain people, yeah. And for other people, the solution, the best solution would be something uh, different than a strike, right? Different than a collective active. Uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting, like Howard Rourke, he doesn't do a strike, right? No. He, uh, he, I mean, just, yeah. he operates within the society system rather than trying to change it. And then, you know, he builds up his little comrades along the way. Um, right. So in that extent, like, Fountain is a lot more realizable than Atlas Shrug. But the Atlas Shrug conditions were those that where the government becomes, uh, you know, starts resembling Soviet Russia more and more and more. Yeah. So, I, th I think there are, there are various stages, let's say, to the progressive... Uh, or there, there are various stages for which some strategies are more useful than others, right? So in a highly chaotic um, in-state, end-game scenario, maybe the strike is the only final solution. Right? No. But, but I think that it, you'd expect to end yeah, the Yeah. But one of the things that captures Ran, like the Randian heroes is they never sacrifice their voice. They always do John Galt's, uh, sorry, Peterson's. <laughs> that was an interesting Freudian slip. They always <laughs> do uh, Peterson's, um, you know, speak the truth, uh, even if it hurts, uh, rule. And you see the consequences to the heroes who don't follow that rule and it destroys, like it makes them in the belly of the whale and you know it's people like rock who gets them out so. right which i think is like this important of like you know rock is that five percent dissenter kind of guy like the vocal dissenter and then his comrades and companions are like the 15 percent like they're vulnerable but still dissenting and i think that um you know, and then through them, then they're able to, you know, make an impact against, you know, the mob who is being fought then by the, like this 30% of exploited people. So I think like, you know, that's like for the libertarians to actually fight and vocalize, well, not really fight, that's pretty much only has negative connotations now, but to actually be able to, you know, debate and vocalize, um, you know, their considerations and for them to actually be listened to, uh, which is, you know, this 
why censorship is so concerning or compelled speech as well. I, uh, do you think Peterson's going to be a Galt like character at some point? Um, is he going to march everybody to Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he needs, I think what he is, is he's, uh, he's rock. I don't think he's Galt. Yeah, he is kind of Rorkian. Yeah. No. Down. No. Yeah, because Galt wasn't really much of the actual person. He was more like this. Uh... Well, how would you even describe Galt? Santa Claus. Yeah, it's pretty much Santa Claus. Yeah, like this. Uh... Like this Nikola Tesla type guy who then found a way to not kill himself. Yeah. There's actually an interesting, uh, I was researching quotes on suicide recently on Goodreads, and it was a really good one um, by, I can't remember who it was, uh, but it was, the quote was, a book is a suicide postponed. I thought that was so fascinating um, to then say, like, because when you think about what that really means, it's just like it's when someone's cognitive dissonance created volatility between, you know, I guess the hemispheres are just themselves and society, where it had to be rectified and instead of choosing to eliminate the pain that that caused, they choose to express it. And, you know, that then allowed the catharsis of communication between themselves and then not just their hemispheres personally in their interpersonal relationships, but also with society through the process of that book. And I think that uh, that's really interesting. It's kind of like the idea of putting a baby in a boat and then pushing the boat down the river. Uh, so created this, something. A book is a suicide postponed. Is that the creating of the book or the reading of the book? Uh, the creating. Hmm. Let me find out who, uh, who actually said that. Yeah, there's a, I, I mean, I think it's often the case that just doing something, anything, uh, will stave off suicide. Emil Curan is the one who said it. Um, okay. And he was a Romanian philosopher and essayist. Uh, he published works in both Romanian and French. His work has been noted for its pervasive philosophical pessimism and frequently engages with issues of suffering, decay, and nihilism. Um, yeah, it's quite, it. he was actually, he died only in 1995. Um, but he, he, okay, he was born in 1911 and he was Romanian. So he definitely suffered, I guess, a lot under those wars, I guess. Um, it's hard, it's hard to say, but probably, probably. Yeah, I don't know, man. There's a. Uh... Hmm. There is, there is a strong desire within me to help shape a world such that things like Nazi Germany can never happen again. But there is also a profoundly deep sense that that's not wholly possible. The best you can do, it seems, maybe is just like save a certain portion of the population from something like that. Maybe. 
right? Or maybe you can see iterative improvement over time that increases the percentage of the population that is saved from a scenario like that. But it seems like even with increased uh, economic activity and raising people out of poverty, even, even in the case of the phenomenally affluent United States of America, we have found, along with the rest of the world, the most ridiculous, hedonistic, absurd arguments to wrap ourselves up in and start tearing ourselves apart with, like the old SJW nonsense. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. If, <laughs> I think there's it, such a testament in that we haven't blown ourselves up yet. Like the no, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I don't. I said, that's like, the like that's line. amazing, but it's so like amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we got so yeah. close to, we got so close. Yeah. But it's just, it's so amazing, right? Like that we haven't blown ourselves up yet. Like it's such a testament, I think. Like, no. yeah, yeah. There was, there was definitely quite a few times where civility saved us for sure. Where, where logos, where communication between world leaders, especially like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. But it's also like, I guess, you know, purely from an objectivist perspective, it's kind of like our self-interest saved us. Because like a nuclear warfare destroys anyone's ability to self-actualize and self-interest. Yeah, but self-interest doesn't save other people. Not at all, right? I mean, some people lie in the gutter with a needle in their arm <laughs> until they're dead. Yeah. That's true. There's a certain kind of people that have a profound self-interest, and that's the Rorkian type, right, on the far end of the spectrum. And right. then there's another uh, type that that has a very hard time finding a good sense of self-worth and, and need to probably derive a lot of it from external sources. Yeah, group association. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for that then, like, let's take the, I think we've solved, like, the questions we wanted, we set out to solve, and now we're just going to uh, titillate ourselves with other questions. <laughs> um, so I think, okay, the bit about, okay, uh, let me just take a break. I'll take a little few-minute break, and then I'll let I, you I've uh, actually probably got it. I have probably got to pass out in a couple of minutes so Alrighty. all right well actually let's let's wrap this up then because uh, I think we did a pretty good pretty good effort at answering those questions so we've got okay how can we re so what manifestations of ordinary men are happening today so collective versus individual because it puts the collective interest over an individuals autonomy responsibility and interest for another individual how to prevent the ramp up to society with such a discrimination as possible, listen to the centers and don't punish them. How are we risking the same today? Uh, code of conduct, politics, group versus group politics, the desire to go on a strike and set up your own homogenous society instead, rather than working out your issues with the centers. Um, and how to structure society? Well, we got liquid democracy and um, all these other things, but I mean, there's so many things that we can do to help facilitate individual and impersonal responsibility that just have not been done and refuse to be done. Because I guess is well, that's I guess well, that's the th where I want to go into this, which is how can we get the person with zero self worth to stop associating with a group and associate with the strength of their own ability as an individual, like. I mean, it, even if that is the cause or not, like if that's the cause, then how do we, you know, help that? Like, how do we assist people in taking? You have to invite them into a better group, right? That's like one that way. doesn't the only enable way. their excuses. Yeah, it's the only way, and, and and I think most of the time people feel like when you're engaging with them in debate or these SJW types, they they almost certainly feel like you are not inviting them to their group. Or to your group right like at no point even though you're constantly reminding them look let's have a nice pleasant conversation i'm not trying to tear you down let's have let's talk this out they still don't feel like you are ever inviting them into their group because they're kind of primed for that that's the dominant message 
There's right. this extraordinary exclusion. And and so we have to find a way to get that across that the uh because these are the people that need a group, right? They have to have a group. They they feel most comfortable in a group and they've been excluded. And they're complaining about the reasons for the exclusion because they dye their hair pink or they want to call themselves a weird gender or whatever, right? This is one of the things that baffles me about like video clips from popular dissenters or even on Reddit communities. So it's like people just are posting things to get like group approval, like the comments that people post. And like oh, you yeah. just watch the whole thing on autonomy and now you're posting comments for collective approval. And <laughs> it's, it's uh I'm convinced that people I don't I don't know, I've been going my whole life thinking that people see the world. Like actually see it like their eyes are open and the data is going in and it's getting processed mm -hmm. and and i just don't think that's the case uh for so many like i i don't know that the, the profound difference in perspective is widening the older i get i i, I used to think that there was a, a much wider shared vision between people and it's it's very very different I don't know, it's kind of like imagine, imagine you were a, one, of, uh, one of the individuals who have a, um, a short-term memory problem and you can't make any new memories, so you can only keep like a five-second buffer of reality in your head, right? Imagine the world that you'd live in. I think these people are kind of like that. They live in like a five-second buffer, and the only thing that can exist in that five-second buffer are these ideologies. Right, that's it. Right. There's no And it's more also room. like from an emotive area, it's constant betrayal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they feel ex they feel excluded from the dominant group. They feel like they've been pushed. Like it's you, you can imagine just an old tribe, right? Like a gathered around the bonfire at night, and we we've kicked this person out into the shadows, and they're kind of looking off <laughs> from the shadows at the fire, kind of longingly, and they just get pissed off and they start throwing rocks. That's what's going on. So maybe that's what is needed, outreach, right? And that's what the SJW communities do. So they do outreach to the marginalized groups to then convert them into their ideology. Um, to be like, hey, don't worry, we support you. We invite you to our campfire. Now you're a political weapon. <laughs> Whereas, um, uh, you know, that's something that uh, conservatives which is interesting, like it really depends on the type of conservatives, like conservatives also volunteer to help, you know, soup kitchens and things like that. Um, but in the, at least in the tech community, I don't think there's that much uh, uh, outreach to marginalized groups from conservative groups, like in the intellectual sphere, uh, conservatives just kind of, you know, keep on carry on, uh, whereas the liberals are doing the outreach. Well, I think that the most dominant uh, reaction right now is one of uh, either disbelief or aggression. I, I don't know if it's if it's going towards it, a peaceful resolve for sure. But it, we definitely could use more uh, handshaking and conversations and of, of all kinds. But yeah, it, 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 these individuals have to at at some point be it's almost hypnotized, right, into right. thinking that that it may be possible for them to come back into the tribe. Well, this is a uh, Peterson Scandinavian interview. So the full 40 minute interview. Uh, I haven't seen The that. host asked Peterson, you know, his views. And then the female politician kind of is a bit in disbelief, like, huh? Like, where, how could you say such things? I don't agree with these things. But then as uh, the, the last 20 minutes was more about Peterson's personal story, I guess. And in which case you saw a dramatic difference in the transformation of disbelief from the other panel members to empathy and consideration as they realize Peterson does care for their interests and he is a genuine, sincere person. Like the change in the body language is, is really recognizable. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, you know, I found this on Twitter, which is when I call people out for being insincere, like I call their bad behavior out with a witness, so in a public space. And then I say, look, I'm sincere. Let's talk about this with the diligence it deserves. They change tact. 
Um, so I think it's just like maybe conservatives and libertarians need to do more outreach to show their interest in those who feel excluded. Like actually be more actively inviting. Right. Well, that would certainly ameliorate the number of people. It would reduce the number, total number of people that are at the edges of society. Yeah, the, the balance is definitely out of whack. I'll say that. No, yeah. but you see this with Trump as well, like, uh, or, you know, with many politicians, which is uh, often the marginalized go to the politician who sets up a platform for the marginalized uh, because, you know, the individualist approach is to say, well, you in your local community need to solve these problems rather than us passing legislation to, you know, just migrate the problem somewhere else. And I think that, um, yeah, my brain. Yeah, that's, that's the real problem: is that most yeah. people go to politicians to solve their problems, thinking that somehow the government is the savior of some kind. That that is yeah. the real issue, in many cases. Yeah, but it's also like because they believe that they don't have the individual ability to solve it, like that it is a governmental issue rather than an interpersonal issue an individualistic issue like if right. they actually believed there was more power in self-association then uh then they would probably depend less on uh uh puppets or oh, sorry like uh what's it called talking heads speaking on their behalf yeah well go government is the forcing option yeah, that's the the thing that if you get laws passed then it becomes forcible enforceable so Alrighty, well let's uh, let's wrap it up there. Um, so this has been a conversation for the Jordan B. Peterson community. Uh, we do a study group every week discussing Peterson or his related content, uh, as well as his recommended books, such as this one, which was for Ordinary Men by Christopher Browning. This was our last discussion for Ordinary Men. Next week we will be talking. Oh wait, we haven't set a topic for next week. Um, but the, uh, the, we'll set a topic and, uh, uh, it should be quite good. Um, but yeah, so we have two meetings. We've got, uh, this public one and we also have a private confidential one. Uh, you can get all the details at jordanbpeterson.community. All the links are in the description and, uh, you know, a shout out to John and Tyler and myself for conducting, uh, this one. Um, yeah. So, so that's it. Any last words, Tyler? Great. All right. See you, everybody. Bye.